Perfect. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our eLotus webinar today. My name is Donna, and I will be your host and your moderator. For over two decades, eLotus has been your trusted source for continuing TCM continuing education for acupuncturists. We offer the largest selection of online CU courses with over 3,000 CE hours. If if you are new to eLotus, remember to sign up for an eLotus account and receive a free 1CU course as a welcome gift. This offer is valid for new accounts only. As we are navigating the impact of COVID-19 in our lives in this new reality, we hope that everyone is keeping safe and with many states planning on reopening, we are happy to hear that many practitioners are taking precautions on preventing COVID-19 from spreading. If you have yet to visit our COVID-19 TCM resource page at eLotus.org, please take a look when you get the chance. On this page, you will find resources on how to treat COVID-19 with TCM official publications from China on both TCM and Western medicine of what were done in the hospital's interviews with Wuhan. Interviews with Wuhan doctors and much more. I'll share the link with you in the chat room. Okay, so let's go ahead and start today's class is Coronavirus Divergent Channel Diagnosis and Treatment by Mark Mastron. Sorry, I butchered your last name. <laughs> a little introduction on Mark. Mark pursued a degree in biology from the University of Connecticut, followed by graduating from the Swedish Institute where he studied Chinese medicine. He opened and ran Ho Chi Lam's clinic, which was a high volume clinic that employed multiple physicians of Chinese medicine and treated patients who came through its doors. All right, so without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome Mark. And Mark, if you can do a quick testing on your end so we make sure we hear you. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear me clearly? Yeah. yeah. Good? All right. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's get started, huh? Well, thank you, Donna. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Mark. Um, um, I actually currently live in Beijing, but I've been displaced due to the coronavirus. Um, I live in Beijing. I study Chinese language. I actually teach at Beijing University of Chinese Medicine's teaching hospital, Guoyitang. Um, and so I, I teach there part-time while I'm going to school to study Chinese. Among other things, I study Bagua Zhang, uh, a martial art uh, from China with a man who's, uh, who's one of the last real, like, Writers from the last century. So yeah, so that's what I do. So after having this clinic in New York, I or New York and Connecticut, I left and went to China to study. When everything happened, I realized I was in Beijing when this was beginning to start. And I saw what was happening. I saw how um, how the um, what was taking place in Beijing, what was happening in the hospitals. And when I went to um, Taiwan for Chinese New Year, uh, that's when everything blew up. And I was stuck in Taiwan um, because it was a hot zone. I so I sat in Taiwan for three weeks. I started watching what they were doing, what the borders were doing, what the government was doing, what medicine was doing in Taiwan. And then from there, I realized I needed to come to the United States to help. So I flew out from Taiwan um, and I came back here with just a duffel bag that I had clothes packed in for going to Taiwan. And Beijing is like cold. It's like, you know, New York in the wintertime. And I had gone to Taiwan, which was fairly, you know, warmer and 60 degrees or 25 degrees for you who speak you know, Celsius. And uh, when I came back to New York City in the middle of the winter, all I had was pretty much shorts. I didn't even have a jacket. So I was in a rough spot. But I said, when I hit the ground, um, when I hit the ground running, we're going to try to get things going um, ASAP because I saw what was happening. Uh, let me try to adjust my mic. Some people are saying that it's hard to hear. Hopefully that'll be better. Um, so I came back here and I started, I have a history of treating infectious disease. I did it at my clinic, Pochilam. And uh, we saw everything that came through the door, as Donna said. So that included everything from HIV patients to other forms of respiratory infectious disease, um, staph, strep, uh, even gangrenous conditions. We did it all in Chinese medicine. And um, I'm here today to tell you and reaffirm your belief that Chinese medicine will work to treat COVID, will work extremely fast to treat COVID. And at the same time, it's probably one of the most effective medicines in the world to treat COVID. Um, I'm telling you that from firsthand experience. Um, Chinese medicine is probably still used worldwide most successfully to treat COVID, both within China 
China and outside. Um, so I just want everybody to be aware of that. So when I, I came back here, um, I started looking at COVID patients and we started seeing more and more and more. And I started realizing, wait a second, you know, this is, this is starting to get into the system quickly and it's moving through the primary channels and more deeply into the divergent channel. So let's get into the slides here and I'll explain why, because I've written 91 slides. Now I just want everybody to know today that we're not going to go through all 91. This really takes a week of education or more. And also I want to preface this by saying um, divergence and all the channel systems are very deep. Uh, this is just one aspect of how to use a divergence for an infectious disease, which is COVID or presenting like COVID, a, a pneumonia. Um, there can divergence can be used in many ways. So we're just covering one aspect with 91 slides for one pathology. So just keep that in mind. Uh, all right, so here we go. So first thing I want everybody to understand too is that there's a lot of fear around uh, COVID, right? There's a lot of both patient fear and societal fear. And so you need to take that into consideration when you're treating these people. Um, you want to bring to them uh, some sort of uh, hope and some sort of um, confidence that they're going to get better. Because I've seen a number of people, when you go into acute stage, it's, it's a lot different than when you see people with the influenza stage. When you go into an acute severe pneumonia stage, which I've treated, um, and I've treated multiple times, these people oftentimes can look like they've just been hit by a car and pulled off the side of the road and they're crumpled. They're in rough, rough, rough shape. They're gasping for breath. So you need, there's going to be a lot of fear around what's going on and what's happening. And you need to take into consideration that you're going to have to deal with that. You're going to have to treat that, you know, and you're going to have to bring that, that confidence in them that they're going to survive because they will if you're practicing Chinese medicine correctly, they will survive and they'll heal from this. Um, so take into consideration to society, you know, and the fear I have been in and out of um, houses with everyone who's had COVID in the house. Um, I, Every day I get up, I do qigong, I try to eat right, I try to get enough sleep, I exercise, I take Chinese herbal medicine. I'm doing fine. The majority of people who, who experience COVID who, or interact with people with COVID who have a healthy body, who are taking care of themselves, who have very few comorbidities or no comorbidities, will most likely not have many symptoms from this or any at all. So keep that in mind. You want to also make sure that you um, Make sure that you um, are taking care of yourself when you're taking care of COVID patients. So that's something. And also, I want you to remember, these symptoms in COVID are nothing new. It develops into severe, severe pneumonia. We've been treating severe, severe pneumonia and epidemics like this for thousands of years. So Chinese medicine is well-equipped, more than well-equipped to deal with this. Um, so just keep that in mind. So the pathogenic regression we're going to talk about today has been in Chinese medicine for thousands of years. And oh, lo and behold, it's in COVID. There's nothing new under the sun in that case. All right, so things I wanna talk about. Chinese medicine having a long history of pandemics, treating pandemics, um, and even in modern times, SARS, the first successful real SARS treatment that came out of China was one that developed through a Wenbing you know, treatment. Uh, COVID treatments, some of the very first successful treatments for COVID came out of Chinese medicine. So I want to also push that and have you guys understand that that's the deal, all right? So that really works like that. COVID is nothing more than what the Chinese call Tianxing. Tianxing means a seasonal current or seasonal pestilence that's affected by the heavenly qi, the environment that can alter and change pathogenic factors, right? So this is something that's common in influenzas and coronaviruses, seasonal cold epidemics, seasonal warm epidemics. These all fall under seasonal pestilence. You're able to treat every single one of these every single one of these period no but something something every single one you're able to treat COVID-19 originated and sprang from a cooler damper climate that was unusually cool uh, respiratory diseases such as COVID are also very common in human history so being very common people are highly capable to efficiently and effectively deal with coronaviruses with their immune system for the most part when they're healthy so you by maintaining the health of your patients and maintaining your health you make less likely for severe issues to happen with other people's health. And I can tell you firsthand, and this will go on in the prophylactic treatments later on in the thing, that um, every patient that's followed the prophylactic protocol before they got sick, prophylactic protocols, whether they've been herbs or moxa, diet, whatever, none of my patients have gotten sick from COVID. Some of them live within the households of other people who have COVID, and some of them 
our nurses and doctors working in hospitals on COVID floors. And as long as they're following lifestyle, you know, ideas, moxing, taking herbal medicine um, to prevent this, you know, doing Qigong, exercising, getting out in the sun, they're doing fine. So to, you know, calm and quell some of that fear, because you guys are all going to eventually see this one day. Um, most people will have minor symptoms with COVID. Most of the people you will see may be minor and that's okay. That's, that's totally fine. And there will be some people who have severe symptoms, but most people's immunity will deal with this. Um, so, um, one of the things too, personal and societal considerations is that personal health is a key to prevention. So you want to first strengthen your, your patient's immunity. You want to also offer lifestyle suggestions, diet and exercise, two biggest factors, right? These are lifestyle. So many studies in the West have also shown that regular diet, a daily exercise invigorates the respiratory and cardiovascular system, reduces common health problems that are associated with comorbidities of, of COVID-19. So making sure you get out there, getting a light press perspiration, getting out in the sun, going for a walk, breathing, lifting your arms, doing Qigong, you know, cardio things are more important than pumping weights. You know, these things are what make you healthier as an overall person. But again, it's also not something that pushes you until you're dead tired. Something that still leaves gas in your tank so that your body can recover from these exercises. Um, a healthy diet that's made up of predominantly unprocessed foods and that are very, very nutrient dense. Avoid highly refined foods, which are high in refined carbohydrates, refined salt. Uh, make a big difference in decreasing the conditions that exacerbate or that are exacerbated by COVID when you, when you catch it. These are really, really, really important. So diet, super, super, super important. All right. Um, take into consideration the areas in the neighborhood you're also going to be seeing people in. I often tie areas. So they could be low income. They could be um, uh, uh, neighborhoods with a diverse population. Could be Asian, Latino, Black, whatever. Um, and a lot of these people are not going to have access to certain foods or they're not going to have the education for what food should I eat. A lot of times culturally, some of these foods that people eat tend to be very damp causing. They tend to be very fried or they tend to be eating things that come from grocery stores that are really no good. So you are going to have to help to educate your patient as to what to avoid and what to buy. It's really, really important, especially for recovery, which we'll go over later. Um, teach Teaching these patients what to buy, what to eat, and also how to prepare is super crucial. Getting through COVID and then recovering as fast as possible. Avoiding foods that further deplete the spleen and stomach chi with dampness, stagnation, producing phlegm um, and heat. All of these things, any foods that create stagnation that produce phlegm and heat will all therefore weaken the spleen and stomach, thereby also weakening tie in the spleen and the lungs, right? So I list a series of the foods in here, refined foods, excess fruit juices that are going to be high in sugar. All of these things, very, very, very important to take into consideration. Um, so diet for both patient and physician for every stage, even if they're in an acute stage, is really important. Um, a, big a big part of prevention and immunity is the gut health. These foods will be really important for both. So foods that tonify what? They tonify immunity. Where does the immunity come from? It starts in the gut, but also includes the kidneys and the lungs, right? So kidney yang becomes wei qi. The lungs diffuse and disperse weight chi. So you want to do things that will establish and maintain a spleen and stomach resources. So healthy foods and whatnot. So we're going to down here, we have things like millet, lentils, quinoa, tofu, uh, black beans, mung beans, persimmon. All of these things that I've listed down here are just examples. I'm trying to give you guys in this examples of what you can do. Um, and there's a lot more out there. We'll go over that in the recovery stage. Um, sprouted foods that are cooked are much easier to digest. Soup broths are the easiest, and they usually are able to make use of the most nutrients when they're recovering. Soup broths are crucial, and you guys are really lucky today because I included a phenomenal soup broth at the end from my best friend Simon Lockett, who's a uh, he's a uh, he just graduated from a seven year apprenticeship for Sichuan cooking. Shout out to Simon Lockett, and he we worked on a broth together. I went over it. You'll have the breakdown later on in the notes. And you guys can make this very easily. You can use this as a base for a ton of foods that you're going to be eating. Or you can even make it as a base and freeze it and give it to your patients. I want to tell you guys that I caught some heat earlier on in Facebook when this thing was coming out. Because I was explaining to people that your comorbidities make you more likely to do this. And therefore, you need to take responsibility for them. That also means food. 
But what I didn't bother to tell people on Facebook when they were angry, because I just avoided that, was I actually have racked up a bill subsidizing patients' diets so they can eat healthy, so they can get back on their feet faster. Um, so you may find that if you're that dedicated to these patients and these patients are that dedicated to getting better, you may be purchasing some of these food groups for them, teaching them how to make them, and then allowing them to continue to make them so they get better and then they can repay you later. This is something that's really important, especially in areas where they might not be able to get out of bed. They might not have worked in weeks. You want to help them get back on their feet. Food, super, super important. All right, Qigong cardiovascular exercise is also incredibly important. Uh, this is often overlooked. It's one of the most crucial areas in Chinese medicine. For prevention, reduction of symptoms, um, if co uh, contacted in the um, in a common population and among physicians who will be treating, if you're in contact with a co common population and you're going to be a physician who's going to be treating this, and I assume most of you are, then you guys need to make sure you're doing cardiovascular exercises in Qigong. This is super, super important. Um, it's super important because it's going to strengthen your Wei Qi. It's going to strengthen Qin Yang. It's going to strengthen the lungs. It's going to strengthen the internal Zhang Fu, right? So this is super important. Uh, it's also going to speed patient recovery. It's also going to reduce the lingering negative effects on the body from COVID. So, like, I can't emphasize this enough. I actually have a friend of mine who came down with probably what was COVID, but he's in a he's in a um, minority neighborhood, and they won't offer testing there in New York City in that neighborhood. And we ran him through the soup broth that I explained earlier that we'll have later in the notes. And he was able to get on his feet and start doing Qigong again. We, he had some herbs, but he was able to get back on his feet. He took the herbs, the soup broth, and the Qigong together. Within less than a week, he was back up moving around like normal again. So why? Because you're able to build postnatal qi while dealing with the pathogenic issue, right? This is a this is a guest host issue. You know, you're hosting a pathogenic thing that comes in because you have some sort of weakness in your body. You want to strengthen those things so you can push them out. All right, next thing. All right, now we're into diagnosis. So. I want everybody to understand here that when I wrote my case study, if some of you haven't read it, it's around, it's on Facebook. You guys can look on my wall. You'll see my name at the end of this. You can add me and look on my wall for this. Um, and you can download it from Google Drive. I went through a lot about what I did, but some of it was probably a little unclear. So we're going to clarify some of that today. Um, diagnosis and pattern. So initial stages. Initial stages are depend on a person's strength and weakness. You're going to see a ton of initial stages patterns. You know, I've seen a lot of things. I've looked at a lot of different people's studies, both uh, coming out of China, coming from other people here. You'll see everything from wind cold invading the exterior, invasion of the lungs by damp cold, damp cold obstructing the spleen, toxic heat in the lungs, on and on and on, wind cold invasion of Taiyang, wind heat invasion of the exterior. doesn't matter, right? Because it's a pathogen. It doesn't matter what virus it is. It's what the person's constitution is, and what the energy of that pathogen, pathogenic factor is coming in and how they interact, right? It's a relationship. And create this relationship creates the reaction you're going to see. So what you need to do is be very acutely diagnose your patient. So as a, as a pathogen progresses internally, the same thing. It generally moves into the lungs first, but sometimes it can start in the stomach, right? And as it moves into the lungs, it creates what? Toxic internal heat and spreads internally, right? So again, you'll see diagnoses. Xiaoyang syndrome, epidemic heat obstructing the lungs and dropping into Yang Ming, right? So it's going to be lung issues with digestive issues. Toxic, uh, toxic stagnation obstructing the lungs, damp cold obstructing the lungs, on and on and on. These are just examples of things that I've pulled up or I've seen, and even some that I've personally seen in patients. Again, it's about you acutely diagnosing your patient. If you're here and you're a Chinese medical physician, you need to be able to acutely diagnose your patient, right? So that way you know how to treat it. It's not that you can't treat it. It's about creating a strategy. It's about being confident and being also educated well enough to be able to treat a strategy, be prepared to figure out a treatment principle. That's what you want to do. So most important thing, accurate diagnosis of your patient once you start treating them. Remember, just because they might have COVID doesn't change the fact that Chinese medical diagnostics differentiation, the diagnostic differentiation is super important for the effective treatment of Chinese medicine, right? If you don't have a diagnostic differentiation, what are you doing? You're just throwing darts in the dark. You don't know what you're doing. So if you want to, and that way also, the clear diagnostic differentiation is going to help you understand more when you get a reaction from the patient. Am, am I right? Do I need to change something, right? It's going to give you a waypoint, you know? 
It's like a map. You're going to pick that waypoint. You're going to go towards it. Oh, wait, am I off? Do I need to adjust? It's really important to use that. Use that as a measuring stick. Um, if the pathogen is in the exterior, then approaching it from a primary channel point of view is very effective. I've treated plenty of COVID patients who are confirmed COVID patients. I've treated dozens and dozens at this point who, when it's in the exterior, primary channels work very, very well. So they don't even need divergence for most of them. Primary channels, and we'll go over some points. Um, they work very, very well. They'll clear the heat out. They'll clear the dampness out. They'll clear whatever. However, what I found by looking at people on forums talking a lot about this, um, what I found was a lot of times you notice that things get really, really confusing. It'll say things like, oh, well, this seems like it's heating Yang Ming and the pericardium, but this one over here seems like it's got these symptoms and a little bit of this and a little bit of that. The reason why is because it leaves the idea of, of Zhang Fu and moves into channel systems. And you have to be very clear about where the channel is moving and what the physiology of the channel is. This goes back to why I switched to divergence when treating is because by treating with divergence, it explains everything that we're seeing with COVID. Everything. Like, I'm not even exaggerating. Everything is seen. Because it explains the pathogenic progression and then how the body is shutting down. Right? It's losing its resources to maintain itself. And it's shutting down. And you're seeing this as the body is trying to scurry the pathogen and hold it somewhere else to keep it away from the organs. The pathogen is burning through things if the body's not strong enough to kick it out. And that's where we're seeing all of these incredible and, in some cases, downright scary symptoms. But guess what? The good news is you have the ability to treat it. If you're a Chinese medical physician, if you're a Chinese medical physician, you have the tools at hand to treat this. So it doesn't matter if you have severe pneumonia, GGO lung glass. So that's ground glass opacity lung imaging where it fills up with phlegm. It doesn't matter if there's severe shortness of breath high fevers, blood clotting, rhabdomyolysis, organ failure, Kawasaki syndrome, neurological issues, whatever. It's all described in Chinese medicine, and it's all described based on pathogenic progression of the, of the divergent channels as a pathogen moves in. So it's important to consider that, a, that the pathogen has, be, has possibly overcome the body's ability to ward it off in the exterior through the primary channels. So it's been shunted into your body's divergent channels in an attempt to keep the pathology away from the organs. That's why we're seeing these very severe and very unusual um, symptoms. So we'll go a little more into that. All right. First, we'll, let's talk about the primary channel point selection. This is more for exterior conditions in, in COVID when they're first coming on. Um, I want you to remember a couple things. All yin spring points clear heat in their respective channels. Every single one. So any yin spring point can clear heat. You're starting to get wind heat in the lungs, yin spring points, jing well points, you know, lung three, we'll go over these things. Uh, all jing well points clear their respective channels and assist in the exterior and opening of the upper portals. So they release the exterior, they can do sweating, they can open the upper portals, you can clear things out. So yin spring points, jing well points, what happens? You can use them to clear and release the exterior. All low points treat rebellious chi. So remember, if you have a patient who's having trouble breathing, that's rebellious chi. You can calm and sedate that rebellious chi and help to anchor things by using low points in your treatment. Chi cleft points both help to consolidate chi and hold on to it if they're deficient, but it also helps to disperse ex excess chi. A lot of these are just Chinese medicine 101. You already have these, you've already studied these. These are solid and they work every, every time when you're dealing with these when you're dealing with COVID or something like that that comes in the exterior. All right, ideas. I'm going to give you a couple ideas that I've used, but also ones that you can find that other people have used. So a very common one that we used in China when we started seeing these pneumonia patients was a combination of kidney three and lung six, right? As a combination, it's very highly effective at arresting wheezing, opening the lungs. It's also effective at reading, at, a, um, at increasing your SpO2 over time. Sometimes it doesn't do it right away. You'll find that when you treat people, if you're using a pulse oximeter, you'll find that it seems like the number goes down. It's because they get super relaxed. But you give it time and it'll come up, especially after a few hours in a day. Needling that combination does a phenomenal job. I've used that combination and I'll, um, maybe later with Donna, I'll send, I'm allowed to send a, an audio I have of a patient. He gave me permission. Um, I came into his house and he was wheezing very hard. You'll hear it in the um, audio. 
we need old kidney three, lung six. And he said, ow, when he got to lung six, it was very tight. And when he said, ow, then suddenly you stop hearing him breathe. And I said, on the audio, you stop hearing him breathe. And I say, take a breath. And he breathes nearly silently suddenly. So he went from <gasps> to like a normal breath, that fast. It's not something you have to wait for. It's not herbs. It's not other things where, you know, you're gonna, even Western medication, you're gonna have to wait for this stuff to take place. Acupuncture should work immediately. It's an emergency medicine. It should work immediately. Um, you put those needles in, you get the, you, you obtain the chi, the chi arrives. You should get a response immediately. You should see symptoms abate. You should see pulses change. Things should happen. And if you're not doing that, then you need to recheck what's going on. Another one, obviously, large intestine four, large intestine 11, dispersing exterior heat. Very common for dispersing heat. Um, Large intestine seven clears heat and detoxifies people, especially when you have Yangming fire and you get this a lot in COVID patients, right? Um, especially if it comes in the digestive area. I've had a COVID patient. One of my first ones early on in February was uh, worked at the Navy base in Virginia. And they had, he had caught it through his office as people had come back from, um, from Italy. And they didn't bother to check him at that time. And he immediately started having uh, nausea, he started having upset stomach, a fever, and he was constipated. He didn't have loose stools. He had a lot of heat drying up. His so we immediately hooked him up with herbs because I couldn't go see him. And within 8, 12 hours, he started getting better. Now, if I was there with acupuncture, we probably could have gotten that started even faster. Uh, stomach 36, really important point. Also would do 14. Now, if you pair things like large, this comes from Wen Bing ideas, large intestine 11, large intestine 4. Then you bleed stomach 36, do 14. You can even bleed large intestine 11 and large intestine 4 if you want. You will get a decrease in their fever instantaneously. It'll go down. I'm telling you it'll go down. You, you can even cup it if you need to to get more blood out. The fever will go down. This is very, very good for people with high fevers, whether they have COVID or not, right? Lung 10, lung 11, releasing heat from the, you can bleed this to release heat from the exterior, and particularly to release heat from the lungs, especially with people with severe, severe, severe lung heat, right? Also, yeah, I've used this in, in right in the like right in someone's home when they're telling me their lungs feel super hot and burning. You needle this, you disperse it, you bleed the end, and guess what? Suddenly they're breathing better. Suddenly their lungs are more comfortable. They don't feel the burning pain. Yeah, it's fast. It's not slow. It's fast. Lung seven descends rebellious chi, alleviates wind and phlegm. Somebody's coughing. You have this wind phlegm. You have the spasming of the of the um, diaphragm, right? And this rebellious chi from the lungs coming up, coming up, coming up. Lung 7 helps with that. It helps to calm and alleviate wind and phlegm and to send rebellious chi. Remember, it's a low point. So, lung 7 being a low point helps to absolve rebellious chi. Lung 5 clears lung heat and phlegm to send rebellious chi. This works phenomenally well. You can actually use it and needle it and tug the point quickly. So, when, oftentimes I'll needle it. You'll get it to catch the channel. You don't have to go too, too deep. You just go pretty surface. And you twist it a little bit so you feel it catch the channel. Then you pull it out very quickly, and you'll, the person will feel a twang go down their arm, all the way to their thumb oftentimes. This is the idea of opening the lung channel quickly, and that will cause it to start clearing phlegm from the lungs much quicker than just common needling. So that's a technique you can use. Uh, Ding Chuan on the upper back, right? Across from do 14, arrest wheezing. You can point it downwards. It'll arrest wheezing and help to what? Abate rebellious chi. Bladder 11, 12, 13, all assist in the release of an exterior factor. Every single one of them. So even if you're screwing up, oh, wait, did I get bladder 12, bladder 11, bladder 13? They're all going to release an exterior factor from the lungs. Um, they're also going to all regulate lung chi. They're all going to assist in the descending of chi. You have rebellious chi, it's going to help to descend it, particularly from the lungs. Bladder 13 tonifies lungs, nourishes lung yin. In COVID, you're going to see a lot of lung yin deficiency, particularly when it's uh, later on as it gets worse and worse and worse. They're going to see, you, I've had patients who are coughing up blood, just coughing up blood. Like, not even, like, like tuberculosis, right? I've, I've also treated tuberculosis when I was in Thailand. So so when you're coughing up blood, you see this, this will help to nourish the lung yin. And when coupled with points of clear lung heat, lung 3, lung 11, lung 10, you're going to help to nourish yin. And you can even use spleen 6, which is a phenomenal point, both in, like, Dr. Tan's method, the balance method, but also it nourishes yin in the body. So these things are going to help to stop bleeding. Stop heat, clear heat in the lungs and nourish in, right? Spleen six, there we go. Nourishes lung chi throughout the body, nourishes yin chi throughout the body. 
particularly important with a pathogen that develops toxic heat as it consumes yin. COVID consumes yin in the body as it's going through because your divergence work on holding it in latency via yin. So it's going to burn through the yin. They're going to become more and more yin efficient. So what I would suggest is using spleen six if you're going to be using primaries. Definitely using it. When combined with other points, as we said, like bladder 13, it will nourish, it will move the yin to the area. So it will help to direct the yin that's being created to the organs that it's associated with. Um, so this is really also good for also tonifying the spleen, right? And resolving dampness, which all happen in COVID-19, right? It attacks the function of the spleen and stomach. And what happens? You end up with this increased phlegm. And if the spleen's not strong enough, as it ascends, stomach yin, like the, the thin fluids upwards, and tries to transform them, the yin chi from the stomach to wei chi to support the wei, if the spleen is weak, you will end up with dampness, which will form phlegm due to the heat. So this will help to avoid this. Bladder 17 releases the diaphragm, right? So you're going to get diaphragmatic spasms. You can cut the area. A lot of patients get stabbing, stabbing, stabbing pain around that area, just above and just below, and sometimes up there, upper and lower back. So you can cup it, you can needle it, you can gua sha. We're going to talk about that later as well. Bladder 18 soothes liver, cools fire and damp. You will get a lot of patients with COVID who have liver fire. They'll end up with liver fire due to this. They could have even had it before. That's a comorbidity. We would see that as one in Chinese medicine, right? Liver fire. You know, they're pissed off about something. They're always angry. But in Western medicine, they're not going to see this as a comorbidity. You know, they might have mildly high blood pressure. That's what the Western medicine will see. But they're not going to see liver fire with red eyes and these things as a comorbidity. We will, right? And that will exacerbate COVID-19. That'll exacerbate any sort of pathogenic factor. So this is another one. You want to sue the liver, clear and cool fire. You, what, you pair that with what? Spleen 6, you nourish liver yin. Um, pericardium 6, Sanjiao 5. This is, a, this is a combination that I started using for patients. I added a little bit more in here with uh, heart issues. Um, they're both low points. So they both help to calm down rebellious qi. They open up the yin linking and the yang linking vessels, right? So they help to move yang and yin through the body. For you people who studied uh, eight extras at Qijing Ba Mai, what are the yin and yang linking vessels about? They're about linking yourself through time, right? As you age through time. So it's going to have a big connection to aging and things that happen through age. So when you're talking to patients who are older, who are having diaphragmatic issues, right? And they've always, they've been having breathing issues and whatnot. Pericardium 6, Sanjiao 5, they'll have a very strong connection to the yin and yang linking vessels as the person is aged through time, which can help to open up the body internally. It can also help to move yin and yang through the body. So with this said, I don't necessarily find it based on the common dead men anatomical point. I go around to find the Asher point. Really, really important to find that, even on the back, right? Sometimes they're a little different because these also, if you want to take, for example, the balance method idea, what happens? Where is the center of the chest, right? Pericardium 6 is here. Where's the center of the back, right? So you, you notice that this fits multiple theories together. This will help to open up the diaphragm. It's going to help to open up the chest. It's going to have a really strong ability with rebellious chi. It treats heart conditions. I personally, in clinic, have a number of patients who come up with atrial fibrillations, severe atrial fibrillations. My grandmother is one who has severe, who's had a history of severe atrial fibrillations. So severe, she's gone to the, now, Western medicine, they don't have a treatment for this. They'll take you into the hospital. They'll put IV in you, and they'll let you, you know, they'll let you um, convert on your own. You can needle these points. I've had people convert in less than 30 seconds by needling these points. So why? Because it will calm the rebellious chi. However, here's the catch. If the person is very, very deficient in, say, blood and yin, you will have a much harder time getting these to work. Why? Because they're low points and they're dependent on blood. And the yin linking vessel is what? Dependent on yin in the body. So if you're looking at somebody that's deficient, remember, back to diet. Whether it's a heart issue, whether it's COVID. So convert means for you to have a question. Convert is a medical term for when the heart is fibrillating wrong. Converting it means to bring it back to a correct beat again. So you can needle these points to bring a heart that's in atrial fibrillation back to beating correctly. I've used this in clinic. I, I, I put the two together one time in clinic because I was like, wait a second, how would this work? I tried it. And I had very strong results the first time. So I've used it a lot with COVID patients who have diaphragmatic spasm. Why? Because it's in the same area. And it's severe pain. And you find the areas and you needle it. You needle it pretty strongly. And guess what? Um, I usually go two needles, but you can go straight through if you want. 
and they will have a the, the diaphragmatic pain will oftentimes release. Sometimes you'll have to cup or wash out of the area, but in combined, it will definitely release because of the area it's associated with other channels, the yin and yang linking vessels it connects with, the fact that the San Jiao channel moves through the uh, the diaphragm, all these different things. When you have more and more reasonings overlapping in acupuncture, that usually makes the point stronger and have a stronger effect. All right. Um, all right, pathological movement. Now we're into the what a lot of you guys came here to look for. So divergence. So again, um, um, I graduated from the Swedish Institute. Um, my foundation of Chinese medicine uh, came from the Swedish Institute. For you guys who don't know about the Swedish Institute, it was a, uh, a college in New York City, a Chinese medical school in New York City. Um, and the Chinese medical school portion, because it taught other things, was founded by Jeffrey Yuan. Um, so I studied under him. He was my basis for Chinese medicine. And I went out and I studied with other people. And I've also continued studying with Jeffrey. I don't write too much about it in my bio, but but so a lot of what I'm going to present to you is one aspect of how to use divergence as I've learned them, but then figured out how to use them through clinical application and make them my own, right? And my hope is that you guys can take this and make this your own and make it work for yourself. Because that's how we were always taught in school, is to take it and make it your own and really get to know it. So I hope that through what I'm saying here, you guys are going to be able to use this and make this your own. Um, so pathological movement and divergence, some things to understand. If Wei Qi, when it's fighting a pathogen, becomes insufficient, not if it becomes too weak, if it becomes insufficient to fight, then what will happen is it can work on taking that pathogen and shunting it into the divergent channels. If it's too weak to fight it, then the pathogen is probably going to enter the Zongfu, right? But if it's insufficient, it clicks over and it can send that pathogen into the divergent channels to be held. That way the yin substances of the body, the jing, the blood, the fluids, can all kind of hold it back it can hold the battle of the Wei Qi and the pathogen together in isolation, kind of like freezing it in time and trying to hold it there. You know, and it'll still move around and create heat, and we'll talk about that in a bit. But it'll hold it away from the organs and hold it away from the rest of the body, hoping that you can regenerate, right, enough to kind of eventually push it out. So this is a backup system. Physiologically, they also work to help back up and support primary channel function. You know, they help to support, you know, all the different things that's going on. So think about when you have like kidney heart disharmony, right? And, oh, we're having obstruction in the liver and the pericardium channel, so they're not functioning very well. Well, then why don't you have heart issues? Well, because you have backup channels. One of them is the bladder divergent, which is able to connect the kidneys and the heart together so you won't have extreme issues. So there's, divergents are a backup channel for a lot of things. So it's, it's a really, really good, really, really good thing. Um, so they will, they will make an effort to shut shunt this pathogen, the Wei Qi will make an effort to shunt this pathogen away from the Zongfu into the divergence in an effort to gain the person's time. Um, in the long, in long-term autoimmune conditions, which divergence are commonly used for, this plays out in years, months, and years. So this is more kind of like rusting. So rust, there's multiple types of oxidization, oxidation, right? So you have rusting, which is a slow oxidation, and then you have a fast burn, like a bonfire. That's a fast oxidation. They're both oxidizing. But rust is like a very slow burn. So you can think of autoimmune conditions. They might have had a, a, a fire at one point that oxidized. But then what happens is over time, that, that fire kind of cools down. And you get this kind of rusting of the system because things are being held in place and it moves it away. That would be more of an autoimmune idea, right? But when you're dealing with COVID, COVID's a fast burn. COVID's a roaring fire. So it's still, and I don't mean to take the word oxidation as like a, like a Western chemical understanding of it. I'm just giving you a metaphor, right? So we're dealing with a fast burn in this case, not a slow burn of the autoimmune. However, COVID can, if, if suppressed in the body long enough and not fully cleared out, can be held in latency and result in long-term issues due to residual pathology being buffered and held by the yin substance of the body, suppressed in the person. Or are never able to fully recover and resolve it. And that's why you see a lot of people who three, four months out, they're still weak. They're still not, they're still having issues because their yin in the body has become deficient. And oftentimes they could still be holding on a pathogen. So that could be something. Now I don't mean pathogen in the sense of always that they're holding on to the, the virus. They could be. But remember, in Chinese medicine, we're not looking for a specific virus. We're looking for a pathogenic factor that can be a virus, but it can transform into something else. Now, can that virus be held in the latency? 
in tissues where we can't find them, kind of like Lyme disease or something? Yes. But it can also transform into some other, you know, um, environmental factor, you know, wind damp becomes wind heat type of thing. Do I foresee chronic COVID in the future? COVID's here to stay. It's a coronavirus. This is another reason I was asked to do this class because you're most likely not going to get a vaccine for this. It's the coronavirus. We have never historically created a, a coronavirus vaccine that's been safe or effective. The last virus, or the last vaccine that was created for coronavirus was with SARS, and it created uh, severe pulmonary autoimmune disorders, so the body started attacking the heart. In this case, what we're seeing is we're seeing a brand new pathogen entering the world, and our bodies are having to figure out how to deal with it. But guess what? We can deal with it. It's okay. This, while there are symptoms and there are things to worry about and take care of, this is not the Black Plague. Half the world is not going to die from this. You have the ability to quickly help people. You have the ability to do these things. Hell, you even have the ability to treat the Black Plague. That's what they did in China during the Wenbing School, right? So, All right, so functions of the divergent channels. Um, so divergent channels support the body's jingu and zangfu physio physiologically when dealing with pathogens, right? They, all, they engage when the jingle fails to address a situation physiologically or a compromise pathologically. So that means whether whether uh, you have a destruction of the channel, and so it goes to back up and support it, or whether you have a pathology that the primary channels can't deal with, it will divert it away, right? In Chinese, we call it the jingbia, the other channels, related to the idea that these are the other channels that are used when the jingle, the primary channels can't be used, right? So... They move between the way level and the UN level, right? To either push things out through the way level, through strongly assisting the body to release something via, via motivating the yin substances of the body to move things out, or they consolidate the jing, the blood, the fluids, the chi, these yin, as many yin substances as possible to reinforce a channel and function or to hold a pathogen in latency. So they have these multiple functions. So they also pull things into the level of the bone. So when you have a pathogenic issue with Wei Qi and they're fighting and it's being pushed into the divergence, they will try to use that yin substance to take whatever yin substance is holding it in latency to drive that fight, that combined Wei Qi and pathology into the level of the yuan, into the level of the bones and the joints where the yuan Qi and the jing can hold it as long as possible, right? Or whatever yin Qi you have can hold it as long as possible essentially putting the pathogen in latency. This is in order to keep the pathogen from going to a particular organ when the jing lows fail. That's what this is for. This is to keep you alive. And um, and that's what we're seeing a lot of in, in COVID. So this is called translocation. It's moving and translocating this pathogen. Um, Jeffrey coined a term called disease nemesis theory. And this is the idea. It's a very, very clever um name. So in school, he would always talk about how this is a disease nemesis theory, meaning it will take a pathogen and it will put it somewhere else so that you don't have the raging pathogen affecting your zongfu and killing you. It'll give you a bad hip or it'll create joint problems or it'll do something else when you can't deal with a full-on presentation of the pathogen in the primary channels. So he called the disease nemesis theory. If any of you have studied with Jeffrey Ewan, you'll hear him refer to that sometimes when he's talking about divergence. So instead of dying, you'll end up with bad joints or something else. You see this in Lyme disease and things like that. Um, you also see this in COVID patients. Um, it's trying to buy you time. That's the idea. You're translocating these pathogens. So the idea here is that the body will translocate Wei Qi and the pathogen together. I know it's a lot of repeating, but I want people to understand this. Together in this struggle, as it's being held in the, in the Jing, in the Yuan Qi, by Yin fluids, whatever's being used, this struggle and the fallout between the two, because remember, there's heat involved. This is still going around. Even if it's a little bit, there's still vibration. It's still trying to move around. It's still battling. It's creating heat, right? So you have, it creates heat. Between these two, there's a fight, and it's still creating heat in the deep level of the body, in these other channels away from the zone. This event in Chinese medicine is the heat that is translocated in the body. So the body knows that there's a fallout. It's like, we got to get this fallout away from the zone, food, right? we got to move this this fallout, this fight outside, you know, when you're in a bar, and two people fight, and they're like, go outside, take it outside, you don't want damage in the bar. Same idea, the body's like, we got to get this out of here, we got to move this somewhere else, keep it somewhere else, so that it doesn't damage the rest of the body. For all you guys who bar fight, you know, I don't know how many of you guys bar fight, um, but, but 
in this case, you're translocating this through the divergent channels to be held in latency. Um, holding the pathogen in latency gives a person time, hopefully, to build up other resources. Generally, in autoimmune conditions and this and that, you can see that much quicker. In COVID, you need to be very vigilant on treating the person and getting them food and or herbs, qigong, these things to keep them up. You need to, and we'll go into treating. Holding the pathogen latency gives them time to build other resources because they aren't actively fighting that. So you see a couple of times you've heard of COVID, the person seems to, they get a really bad reaction and they seem to get a little better. They call that a false dawn, right? And it's something that gets really bad. That's divergent channels activating, holding this pathogen away from the body holding it away from the zong so you're not seeing many symptoms. There are symptoms going on, you just have to know where to look. And then, as the pathogen burns through all of this substance, it blows up again. Now you've got it, it the body can't hold in latency anymore, now you're going to see all these really severe symptoms where everybody starts to suddenly slide downhill, and the whole world's like, oh shit, what are we going to do? That's what you're seeing. You're seeing the, the, the barreling through of the divergence. It's been holding it away for so long, and now it's getting released again. Um, so let's go on to the next slide. All right, so I call this the, I call it the substances or the resources like substantia, right? Like the essence, the substances that you need to use. So these resource substantia associated with divergence. This is important to know. So in order to hold on to a pathology and latency or to translocate it, the body must not only have, the, not only, uh, have enough Wei Qi that is sufficient so, but it also depends on the channel layer and how much of the substance associated with that layer. This is, it's not that complex once you start to use it, but it may seem that complex in the beginning. So, bladder kidney have a connection in the usage of the movement of what? Jing, right? The jing of the body. All bladder liver, with the blood. All bladder and liver, ball, the liver stores blood, the gallbladder moves it, right? Gallbladder channel moves blood. It's really important to know your channel physiology. It's super important for you guys. You really don't want to just be picking points. You want to know what the channel does, right? The bladder channel, Taiyang, the kidneys and the bladder both support the combustion of this kidney yang to move up and help to strengthen the, the immunity, right? To create this Wei Qi, right? The gallbladder and liver blood, what? Go to support the Jing and its process of that. What happens? It can move pathogens back and forth. Chao Yang, right? It tries to move them out the back. If it can't do it, it moves around the front, tries it again. You get these alternating hot, cold, hot, cold. Right, to try to move it out, trying to support the Tai Yang to get it out, right? Uh, stomach spleen, it uses Jin, the thin fluids. Small intestine heart uses the yeah, the thick fluids. Sanjiao pericardium uses Qi. And the lung, large, a large intestine lung uses Yang. Now, the differentiation between the last two. The reason why there's a differentiation is because in Qi, you have Yin Yang Qi. But when you get down to the large intestine lung, you're kind of screwed. So you have no Yin Qi left. You just have yang, and yang is very ethereal, and things are shutting down, and you're in a bad situation. This is the people who are delirious, who are being intubated, who, you know, they're in a really, really rough spot. They're gasping, gasping, gasping. Everything's shutting down. Organs are shutting down. That's yang chi, right? There's no more yin. It's burning everything up. So that's that level. Keep that in mind. All right. So what we have here is the resources will all assist the primary channels of their respective physiology. So Jing from the kidneys combusts into Yang and moves up Du and Tai Yang to support Wei Qi. What is this? It's a wind cold expression of Tai Yang. So that Jing supports Tai Yang externally as a primary channel. So that's the that's the, the supporting of that, you know, that substance, that substantia, right, to the Tai Yang. Blood of the liver and the gallbladder channels support the Jing to help in their efforts. And it moves a pathogen back to front. What do you get? You get wind damp and Shaoyang, right? So blood is being activated when you're having a Shaoyang expression, right? So then the Ying Qi, in this case the Jin fluids of the stomach and spleen, are ascended to transform into Wei Qi under the control of the spleen. That's why you want a strong spleen. That's why your digestion needs to be good in the case of, you know, pathogens coming in, you know? Because, again, guest host theory. It's generally not the fact that this is not an issue for people when they're healthy. This is an issue for people when they're unhealthy, COVID-19. So having a digestive system that's good and working and digesting properly and transforming and transporting is super crucial to not only the warding off of this, but the recovery of patients and the, um, and the abating of symptoms.
So and what happens when it transforms the when it transforms this fluid from the stomach, this yin chi, this jin, you get heat, you get this expression, this yang ming expression, right? However, if the spleen is weak, you end up getting dampness. And then the dampness and heat turns into what? Phlegm. Now you get an exacerbation of the phlegm conditions of COVID. You get an exacerbation of pneumonia uh, conditions. All right, so latency. Um, latency occurs when a primary channel fails, right? Again, to repeat this, it fails to resolve the order, or fails to resolve the pathology effectively. The Wei Qi and pathogen together are moved and kept in the urine level by the substance of the associated channel. Over time, the pathogenic heat created by the Wei Qi and the pathogen locked together begin to consume the resources that are being used to hold it. So the pathogenic heat from this will then decline in resource, substan resource substances. So like what happens is um, you'll have say Jing for bladder is trying to hold on to something. It'll eat through that. And now it's got to go into the gallbladder. So you'll start to see a change in symptoms that move from bladder divergent issues or Taiyang issues to what? Gallbladder divergent or Xiaoyang issues, right? So you see this change and that gives you an idea of where the pathogen has come, what, what substances a person is now deficient in. That gives you that idea. So based on the how things move in. Yes, kept in the urine level. Yep. So COVID-19 and the movement from external yang channels to divergence. So when do you know that it moves from the exterior to the interior? So each level can use its resources to hold the pathogen in latency or help battle and push it out. Well, with COVID-19, this pathogen often causes Taiyang, Xiaoyang, and Yang Ming to be overcome very quickly in people who are um, who are uh, who are weak to begin with, right? So you want to you want to understand that because the bladder, kidney, gallbladder, liver, and stomach spleen divergence are assisting their external channels to try to deal with this pathogen with their resources, they will probably become drained. And they probably, they might end up holding on to the pathogen, but a lot of times those become very severe. It skips through those levels pretty quickly because of the fact that they've been using their resources to try to support the primary channels. And by the time a pathogen might be pushed into their, their divergent channel, they're already pretty weak. Um, so substantia, substantia is just a word that I use to mean substances, resources from the divergent channel. Um, so it's a Latin word. It's just, it's a Latin word. Um, so, uh, so these things would go to assist their primary channels, but they become drained. So they are inadequate and insufficient to push out the pathogen. So they're likely to pull it in and try to shunt it, right? So if the Wei Qi is too weak to deal with a pathogen, the resources cannot be roused effectively to support the pathogen, it can move into the Zongfu. However, again, if Wei Qi is not too weak, but rather insufficient, the pathogen is moved into the divergence. Again, I'm repeating this so that people keep up with this. They keep hearing this over and over. Um, there is a debate in Chinese medicine whether the divergence start in the Zongfu itself or whether they're kind of like right before the Zong or the Fu. Um, you know, it, it, I think it depends on a person to person thing. Um, I'm not really into that debate. So I'm, that's, that's not something I, I, I look at it on a patient to patient basis. If I'm starting to see Zongfu symptoms and then suddenly I'm seeing divergent symptoms, well, then maybe it went into the Zongfu and then it got out. You know, but other times I never see the Zongfu symptoms. It jumps right into divergent symptoms. Okay, then maybe it's shunted it off before it got out. Again, I take it on an individual uh, case of what the patient is presenting, not based on something that's written and then holding that above what I'm actually seeing. Like you don't want to do that. That kind of, uh, that puts blinders on you and doesn't allow you to see the true reality of what's happening. So COVID progression in acute cases of COVID. Um, now I, it, I was the prophylactic slides, just so you know, are at the end of this, we adjusted them so that you, we can talk about how to treat acute COVID. Um, so we'll go over that later, but in acute cases of COVID-19, which are marked by symptoms of severe pneumonia, neurological signs, clotting, hemorrhaging, organ failure, on and on and on, encephalitis, Kawasaki, whatever. We are seeing stronger pathogen against a weaker system with insufficient Wei Qi. That's what we're seeing. So the level at which the pathogen is being held becomes compromised. And this pathogen, if it becomes compromised because it's eating through the substances and the pathogen is getting stronger and winning the battle, it will drive deeper into the body consuming the body's chi and blood and fluids. 
just taking down, barreling through these channel systems, right? And that's why you're seeing these people, you know, in 12 hours, 20 hours, 40 hours, just boom, they just drop. Um, and, and they're they're suddenly, they go from going into a hospital to suddenly being intubated. That's what you're seeing. You're seeing this just eating through the, the, the resources and the body can't gather things fast enough to deal with this, right? So this becomes an issue because like a burning house, so you have a house on fire, but then when the house starts collapsing, so we know the house on fire is a pathogen in the Reiki. But then when the channel systems start collapsing, this is like a house collapsing. Now you're stuck in a house that's on fire and it's collapsing. That's, that's an SOL condition. You know what I mean? You want to make sure that you can consolidate those things and you can keep the house from collapsing so that you can deal with the burning fire, right? So the intense heat and the spreading fire is one and the, instru and the structural integrity of the body and the channels and the organs are the other thing. These two things are really, really, really important. All right. So back to the idea of the false dawn. I want to go over this again. In COVID, you'll sometimes get a false dawn or a short-term subsiding of symptoms in COVID-19, only to then suddenly have them reoccur and become worse, putting the patient in critical condition, right? This is a sign that the divergent channels were activated to try to hold something in latency. So it's a sign that this is happening. However, they weren't successful because they either didn't have enough substance, right? Substantial resource, substantial substance, whatever you want to call it, yin, jing, blood, fluids, whatever. Um, uh, also due to the strength of the pathogen, could be also due to the weakness of the patient prior to the pathogen coming in, right? So at this time when the pathogen is consuming the body's resources, you're not seeing like you oftentimes see in other divergent patients. It took months or years to get here. You're seeing hours. You're seeing literally hours a day, two days. It's happening quick. So you want to be able to, you want to be able to treat people in a quick and timely manner. Um, and we'll go over this. I'll talk about this in the slides again, but you're going to have to see these patients daily, probably twice a day. When I was in China, I oftentimes saw when Chinese medicine was practiced as primary medicine, and we also did it at Pochi Lam, I would have, we would have patients who left and come back later on. They, they would just stay in the clinic and then be treated again. At Pochi Lam, my clinic in, um, in New York and Connecticut, these patients would sometimes, the severe ones, would just sit around in the clinic. I'd have them come right before lunch. Then they'd have lunch at the clinic. Then they'd stick around. Then after lunch, we'd treat them again before sending them home. That has a much better effect, much better effect. And in severe acute patients like this, dosage plays a crucial role. So most people with divergent channels use them for long-term autoimmune. We're using them for, you know, quick, fast infection, right? So this is a repeat. We're going to skip this slide. Um, infectious disease, which work fast in acute stages, are like the fast-burning flame. So keep that in mind here. So by the time a person is in an acute stage of the pathology, it's moved through Taiyang. It's surely moved into the level of divergence, which is powerful enough. Um, because it's if powerful enough, it moves into Xiaoyang, Yang Ming, and further into the yin levels. Keep in mind that the following explanation, the explanation we're giving, bladder kidney, small, uh, and uh, what's it, uh, gallbladder liver, stomach spleen, this is an elemental pairing. There are other ways to use the divergence. Uh, this is just one. And this is one that's been super successful in clinic. There are ways where you can associate them with bladder small intestine, called bladder san jiao. So basically, the idea of using tai yang, pairing tai yang, pairing xiao yang, pairing yang ming, you can use them like that um, as well. Those are called, they usually use those in what they call looping needle formats. But in this case, we're using an elemental pairing, but we're focusing on the yang pair being associated with its yang counterpart in the primary channels. Um, so another thing to keep in mind, in elemental pairing, divergent pairing, as you'll see as we go through this, the yin paired uh, channel, so bladder, kidney, you know, the kidneys, uh, yin, liver's yin, spleen is yin, the symptoms are a more severe expression of the yang channel. And they can also include new symptoms, which you're always going to see. So if you're like, well, how do I know if it's like moving from yang to yin, in this case, in this pair, like what channel should I just use bladder divergent or do I need to use bladder kidney? If the symptoms are extremely severe for that level, then you're and they have more symptoms on ball, then you're probably looking at a yin divergent channel. And so you would use a yin and yang together. That's the idea. Um, so the key to understanding pathological progression is to understand this channel trajectory, understand the progression we're about to go over. This makes a big difference.
So I know these are a little smaller, but we'll go over these here. Bladder divergent channel has symptoms um, of pathogenic factors trying to move out of Taiyang, trying to move from Taiyang internally. So pathogens that come around from the back and the neck and the shoulders, wrapping around the chest and coming out into the upper respiratory tract. So people tend to get upper respiratory tract infections. You could think of this as initial onsets of, um, of when cold, when heat, on and on and on. Generally, however, this would be associated with people who continue to get it all the time. They're always getting respiratory, upper respiratory tract infections. They tend to be very weak. Um, every time they get a cold, it immediately becomes an upper respiratory tract infection. This is going to be very important for people who are convalescing with COVID later on. Not really in the acute stage. You're not going to use bladder. Um, not so much. You're, uh, you're, you would use this as a person is recovering and convalescing to help strengthen back and consolidate Jing, strengthen kidney yang, and push out any remnants of COVID in their body. Uh, kidney, di uh, kidney divergent channel has symptoms of both diaphragmatic fullness and heart pain. It's got throat pain, palpitations. So you kind of see it moves a little more. It's got still the same things as, as with the chest issues as the bladder, but it's starting to become a little more severe. All these symptoms can be found in COVID patients just after the initial onset. Um, you can also find this in recovering COVID patients who have gotten past the acute stage and are starting to recover. They can still have chest pains. They can still have heart pains. Um, you can have above and below pains. People who feel cold below, hot above, they feel different sensations. This is common in COVID. This is common in anything that you catch that is a, that's an infectious disease that comes in that doesn't fully get cleared out of the system. Um, you can have diver, uh, uh, digestive discomfort. Some of my COVID patients only have di digestive discomfort and they get test positive. The kidney divergent wraps around and enters with diamond, so it affects the digestion. So remember, where the channel travels says a lot to what physiology it's affecting and what its pathophysiology will be presenting. Um, so, uh, so what will happen is um, we'll go over the needling, by the way, later on it'll come up. Um, so some the other things that you can do is you can have fullness of the chest and the inability to take a deep breath. That's very common in people who try to rec who are recovering from COVID. They, they seem like they've lost lung capacity. You've probably read about uh, things where they say people can lose, what's it, 20 to 40% of lung capacity from COVID, you know, issues and scarring and injuries. You can use the kidneys and the bladder divergent to help correct that, right? These things to help push this out. Because what? You have a residual pathogen. You might not have the virus, but the pathogen and the injury is still there. You want to get it out. You can use these things to treat that. Right, gallbladder, liver. Now, the reason why these are together, like, and really small is because they're more, you don't use these so much in the acute stage, you use them after. But you might see some of them in the acute stage. Gallbladder, liver is progressing breathing difficulty. So after something comes in, right, comes in Taiyang, now it's starting to clamp down on the chest, clamp down on Xiaoyang. Coughing can start to begin here. Gallbladder connects to many mood points. So it's going to start to affect organs, right? That's how it starts to affect the organ function because it starts to get in and the body's trying to hold it in the gallbladder channel whether it's a primary channel or it moves to divergent, and it what hampers the function of the organs via the move points. It can move into the organs from there, right? One of the ones is what? The kidney move. Kidney move point is very responsible for the grasping of lung chi by the kidneys. That is a phenomenal point, right? Uh, gallbladder 25 is a phenomenal point for um, holding down, um, it's gallbladder 25, 26, I forget the names now, but uh, or the numbers, but, um, but it's going to hold down kidney um, it's going to hold down lung chi. It's going to help the kidneys grasp the lung chi. I've used it on COVID patients who are having trouble with that. And that point works phenomenally well when added. When added into a divergent treatment and even added into a primary treatment, right? So all these move points have a connection to the functioning of organs together and also respectively channel-based. Um, coughing, spontaneous sweating. You see this a lot when things come in. The, what, the chest starts to tighten, right? It's trying to keep things from going in. A Xiaoyang presentation, you start to cough to try to push things out. You start sweating to try to get things out. Oftentimes, it's not successful. Sometimes it is. Um, you can get chest and rib pain, alternating fevers. Things are moving back and forth. Uh, COVID patients will often complain of severe stabbing pain in the diaphragm. Severe. Like, this is what oftentimes makes them call the ambulance because they feel like they can't even breathe fully because it's excruciating, right? So, gallbladder 25. Thank you. Yeah. I'm thinking of points in Chinese now. I, I forget the numbers sometimes. Um, so, COVID patients will often complain of this severe stabbing pain. You can, you want to, you can use the gallbladder divergent to help clear this out, right? And stop this. It stops it very quickly. Um, due to the blood trying to maintain latency, many of these symptoms will often end up in wind. This is where you can start to see neurological conditions in COVID patients. 
because the blood is what holding on to the COVID or the pathogenic factor and it's being eaten through, you become blood deficient, you start to get neurological symptoms. This is COVID is where you start to see them, right? When this blood becomes deficient. Liver divergent channel, you'll start to see an increased heat, right? Because the blood's going down. You know, you're getting, you're having less and less blood. So you start to see increased heat, increased inflammation. Now it's starting to kick up. Now you're starting to see more of a more strong influenza stage in COVID, right? The Wei Chi will become stagnant in the lower jowl. You'll see genital and testicular pain. You'll see fibroid cysts. Commonly, we're seeing more in males and females, testicular pain. Um, I don't know how many of you know about this, but many patients in hospitals who check in and even a number of the patients I've seen have complained about testicular pain, urination pain, scrotal pain, these things, because you get this like shan, this disorder characterized by pain and swelling because it's now, the pathogen is now being held in and stopped in the liver divergent channel and being held in the lower area right now. So male COVID patients report testicular pain. Some of you have seen that, like they say, oh, it can be transferred by sperm. Well, why? Because the liver channel goes to the, goes to the testicles, right? So you'll have this pelvic pain in this area. Um, so nurses and patients uh, oftentimes, like I said, they'll, ex they'll talk about excruciating pain, whether it's testicular pain or even urination. In many cases with urination pain, you want to think of something. What happens? The, lu the lungs, what, shunt the pathogen down into the bladder, right? Down into Taiyang, which tries to what? Disinhibit urination and urinate it out. However, if that pathogen gets trapped in Taiyang, it's trapped in the area of Taiyang, which would cover what? The urethra, the bladder, you're going to get a lot of pain. So now you can't urinate it out. You're having trouble sweating it out. Now it's going to move in deeper, right? That's why disinhibiting is a big part of, disinhibiting urination is a big part of Chinese medicine. So that's something that you want to think about. That's something that you want to, when you have this pain in the bladder, you could be actually, so you have the pathogen is stuck in the bladder. You want to help move that out so the person can urinate, so they can freely disinhibit, so they can clear out this external condition. This is something you want to help. And you can use this if it's like scrotal swelling, you're seeing swelling and more blood issues, blood symptoms rather than just urination pain, that's more of a liver issue. If it's more urination pain and bladder-based, that's probably more of a bladder issue, you know, tie on, in which case the bladder divergent, bladder divergent moves through the body and comes to CB2, CB3, so you're going to deal with small intestinal with bladder move, you're going to have the ability to treat those things through the bladder divergent. All right, now we're getting into it. Summit divergent. Summit divergent is involved with keeping the sense organs moistened. Symptoms for summit divergent starting to hold onto a pathogen and losing yin are going to include things like what, nasal discharge, Sneezing, nosebleeds, feeling of cold in the upper teeth. You don't really find feeling of cold in COVID patients, but you can in people who are holding on to um, uh, pathogens in the summit divergent. Spleen divergent is a progression of the inability to transform fluid. So like what we just talked about in stomach divergent, the pathogens come in. It's gnarled your, the ability for the stomach and the spleen to try to make fluids that normally would be ascended via the um, via the divergence. It's trying to keep it away from that area. Now with the fluids it's already got, it's now trying to relocate it with what? The thin fluids of the stomach. So now the stomach is preoccupied, what? With not digesting, but with trying to give up resources to hold this in latency. This pathogen is going to burn through them. You're going to end up with a lot of things coming out, you know, nasal discharge, eye itching, right? Bladder, the stomach divergent channel, it's upper confluence bladder one. You're going to get you know, itchy eyes, you know, you can get eye discharge, you can get nasal discharge, sneezing, nosebleeds, heat rising, right? Spleen divergent is going to be even more. Why? Because the spleen deals with what? The spleen deals with the, the transformation and transportation of fluids, whereas the stomach is really the receptacle, right? So now you're going to find that now you can't transform fluids. Now you're going to start to develop, uh, you're going to start to develop dampness. You're going to start to develop more phlegm. You know, so you're lots more phlegm, lots more dampness. At this point, you're going to get what? A lot of abdominal distension and low back pain. A lot of COVID patients have back pain, particularly the ones who are having breathing issues, ones who are having digestive issues. The, abdom the abdomen here is what? The back's right in back of it, the lower back. So as this starts to create heat and become stagnant, it's going to affect the lower back and the ability to strengthen the lower back, right? So you're going to see things like what? Wind phlegm. You're going to get dizziness, neurological conditions related to wind phlegm. You can get seizures, epileptic fits. You can get encephalite, you know, all these things that are starting to occur. That's more blood-based, but you can see how you start to get these neurological wind phlegm conditions. They're in COVID. People are like, where are they coming from? I don't know where they, they're coming from. Channel progression. Um, 
loss of smell and taste. It's very, very, very common to see loss of smell and taste in COVID patients, as you guys know. This is when it starts to affect the spleen and stomach, and particularly the ability to ascend fluids upwards, you're going to see that. The, I've used stomach and spleen divergent to treat patients who have poor smell and taste, and it works quick. It works really quick. A lot of times, divergent channels, you'll find, while they'll take acute conditions and they'll start to treat them, they'll really take, the real effects will take place while the person sleeps. I've had patients who wake up in the middle of the night, oh, I, I woke up because I started smelling something. I haven't been able to smell in two or three weeks. You know, and suddenly, boom, they wake up because they smell something. It works that quickly. So it can it can happen overnight. And if you're doing it correctly, like a three-day on, three-day off treatment, even sometimes multiple times a day, you're going to have a much quicker result. Phlegm will begin to increase as the spleen divergent becomes, um, becomes weighed down with this pathogen as it's eating through the fluids and kind of breaking up the ability for cohesiveness in the channel, right? So the phlegm is going to increase in the stomach and the spleen divergent, or spleen, stomach, or stomach, spleen, spleen, stomach, whatever you want to call it. It means that you're going to start to have, what, more difficulty breathing. Because why? The spleen ascends, its ascends itself, ascends its fluids where? To the lungs. It's going to add. You're going to get a lot of phlegm and dampness ascended to the lungs via the spleen's ascending quality. So instead of ascending fluids to keep the lungs moistened, you're getting what? You're getting them to ascend phlegm and dampness to try to cough it out. But now the lungs are already weighed down because they're already weak from everything else. So you're going to start to see an increase in what? An increase in pneumonial symptoms, right? It's starting to move into the lungs here more. Not just coughing and, you know, diaphragmatic constriction. Now you're seeing phlegm start to set in, right? So, um, so at, whereas before, so when we're dealing with it affecting the root points, now we're dealing with the spleen actually being affected and not being able to, or, and then it's translocating its phlegm into the lungs. So this is the level where you start to see the lungs filled with phlegm. Really important. Because if you're catching people at these different levels, you don't have to go all the way to the last divergent. It won't be correct. You start at the one that you see. So if you're seeing people start with onset phlegm issues, well, then here might be your level. Remember, also checking the pulse, right? What's going on in the pulse? Are you starting to see a phlegmy pulse? Are you starting to see heat? Are you starting to see these symptoms outside? You don't need to know divergent pulses to treat this. A lot of people are like, well, what are the divergent pulses? Oftentimes, they take a while to you know, get good at. So I don't tell people what the divergent pulses I'm feeling are because it doesn't translate into most people's way of thinking. If you see the pathogenic progression and you take a basic pulse quality, you'll understand where it's going. So at the level of the small intestine and heart, now we're running out of things to hold latency. You start to lose the ability to hold latency. Remember, we can hold latency in bladder kidney. Why? Because we have jing, or we can support the external uh, the external taya. With gallbladder and liver, we can hold things with, with blood, or we can support external shaoyu. With the um, with the stomach and the spleen, we can support the yang menu, we can hold things with the jin fluids, right? They're the refined fluid. But when we get to the small intestine and heart, we've lost the ability to push things out. We've lost our resources. Now you're using the thick fluids, the ye. The ye would come what? The ye would come from the joints, from the marrow, from the brain, all these things, right? So. You don't really, this is pulling from an area that's not really conducive with holding things in latency. You don't have much left. Because remember, if the jing starts to become deficient, it can still call on what? The blood and the jing. If the blood becomes efficient, you can call on the you can call on the jing fluids. But once you get down to the yin, yeah, you don't have any other real yin substance, like real good yin substance to hold things on. So this is where you start to see much more extreme conditions, much more extreme issues. Um we'll see. Uh, at the point, at this point, when these things are used up, this is the last thing. You're going to see it um, trying to hold latency, but it's going to create problems with translocation, right? Where it's moving to, you're going to start to see neurological symptoms take place. I have a question here. Regarding latency, when you say the Wei Qi and the pathogen are moved and kept in the Yuan level by a substance of the associated channel, I'm unclear what you mean. Would you mind elaborating? Is it the Yuan level in the Zhang Fu? It's the Yuan level in the channel system. That's what we're talking about. So in the body, in the layers of things, it's your level. It's keeping it away from the zongfu, moving into the bones and the joints and the the like your end level. So like it would be the bones, the joints, even the neurological system, the spine, things like that. And unfortunately, eventually, it even gets to the brain if you don't get it away. So so COVID progression. 
Um, so here we go, small intestine. Now I'm, I break things down more by slides in this way where it's a little bigger. So because this is where you're getting critical, right? This is, these are the levels that I'm normally coming into patients' houses and seeing them at, and it's, it's very severe. So small intestine divergent level exhibits a body's loss to whole latency. The heat is much more aggressive now. You're going to see a lot of inflammation. You're going to see a full-on presentation of COVID with, you know, rapid breathing and lungs that are full of purulent pus and they could be coughing up blood and, and, and having phlegm and things like that. So due to the lack of the ability to hold latency and symptoms, you begin to mirror the primary channel symptoms. So whereas before we had these symptoms that weren't really associated, okay, I have phlegm, I have neurological issues, I have eye issues, I'm not really those seeing a lot of stomach and spleen issues because they're able to hold it away. However, at this point, you're going to start to notice that divergent channels are becoming weaker and having a lot more trouble holding this pathogen away from the zone food. So a lot of the symptoms from here on out, you're going to be like, but wait, that's a small intestine or a heart issue. I thought it was supposed to hold it away from that. It's supposed to, but it's having a lot of trouble at this point. So your inability to anchor yang and consolidate resources results in the body releasing heat out of the bowels. So at this point in the small intestine level, the, the dwindling jing of the body, because it's weak from, remember, bladder kidney, and then it was trying to you know, move along. It's been eaten through by the pathogen. It cannot support the body. So you're going to have a lot of low back pain. You're going to have, so these it can't support the kidneys. You're going to have diarrhea, because remember, this heat now, too, is down in the bowels. And where are the bowels? The bowels are here. Where are the kidneys? Right in the back, right? So this heat will penetrate in and exacerbate the kidneys, which are already deficient. So you have diarrhea. You have constipation with increased heat development, explosive diarrhea in some of these patients. Some of the patients I've seen have had, like, severe constipation with, with no diarrhea, right? It's more been high heat, high fevers, and constipation rather than diarrhea. If they're having diarrhea, they're becoming more yin deficient, but they're actually helping to expel some of that heat, right? So the body's trying to push out the heat, whether it's successful or not, is uh, is up to the person's um, ability as a body, you know? Oftentimes at this level, it's very difficult to keep that up. And they'll be drained even more and they'll go through progressing symptoms and get worse and worse. So heart divergent. The pathogenic factor now will move back into the chest, right? First into the heart. And then it'll try to move up and out of the body. However, this is where you'll see in COVID patients, you'll get a lot of ex even more extreme root side pain. It'll get worse. They'll start to get palpitations. This is where you see in people with COVID, they have myocarditis. They have a ton of vascular inflammatory processes starting to occur. So when you read and you're like, oh my God, COVID does this, COVID creates, you know, clots and strokes and all these things and cardiovascular issues, it's a progression of the channels. It's all explained. Um, so the vascular inflammatory processes that lead to heart attacks, COVID patients have heart attacks. You Why? Because it's progressed to at least the layer of the heart, if not deeper than that, right? If it progresses beyond the layer of the heart divergent and they haven't had a heart attack yet, it's because the body had enough to protect it and keep it away from the heart before it got there, right? But if it doesn't have that, then you could have a heart attack right in that level, right? So you get more difficulty breathing, particularly in this stage, you get lying down breathing issues you can no longer lie down and breathe you have to sit up um you get lots of dizziness which is already occurring before but this wind phlegm and now you've got a lot of fire it's whipping it whipping it whipping it up a lot of insomnia a lot of dream disturbed sleep you can get tongue symptoms affecting the speech delirium right these things can start to occur they might be minor they might come and go and not be so much but you can start to see a little bit particularly in a lot of covid patients as you know with anybody with a high fever they can have really crazy dreams that are really like very unsettling and they can't get rest. Why? Because it's, it's moved into the heart divergent, right? Uh, cytokine storm, it could be. Remember, look at, when you're looking at that, trying to decide what are the symptoms in the cytokine storm. Cytokine storm can be a number of these levels. But this is why this is cool is because Chinese medicine is far more accurate. What level am I in? What level is the cytokine storm happening at? Think of this through Chinese medicine. Don't think of it through Western medicine first, if you're a Chinese medical physician. Get your ability up to think of it first through Chinese medicine. You will always get a better response in the body because that's what you're trained for. And honestly, I have a Western degree in physical neurobiology. I have a degree in Chinese medicine. Chinese medicine always is able to see the forest and the trees much clearer and much quicker oftentimes than what you'll find in Western medicine. So cytokine storm is a large thing that can happen in a whole area, but then we can we can create the levels and understand that in the cytokine storm. Um, many children will be presenting Kawasaki disease symptoms. 
they're exhibiting a pathogenic factor at the level of divergence. So you'll see what, where, where does the tongue come to? It comes to the heart, uh, the tongue, I mean, the heart uh, comes to the tongue, right? So you're starting to see these Kawasaki-like symptoms and neurological issues. Remember, in Kawasaki disease, some of these kids present with speaking issues after it's over. It's affected the heart. They're in the heart divergent level. There's not enough EF fluids. You need to consolidate them. We'll go over that in a bit. All right, so the increase of severity of heat along with the increase in neurological symptoms are due to yin substances in the body having to be depleted. This is just a review, right? Along now with the loss of the EF fluids. So while the yin is trying to translocate the pathogen, where does it go? Where's the EF from? It'll try to translocate it where? Into the marrow, right? And this is going to result in marrow, bone, and curious organ symptoms. This is where neuromuscular symptoms really start to begin. And if you look at um, if you look at SARS, which was a COVID virus, a lot of the symptoms that related to the ability to create immunity from T cells and things in the bone marrow were affected by SARS. What is that? That's the year that had pulled it into the level of the marrow, but now it's trying to be held there and it's starting to affect these issues. So what would you do? You probably want to start with something like that by treating heart, small intestine divergent, consolidating, helping to push things out. All right, so uh, members. Okay, so remember in the gallbladder and liver channel, in the gallbladder liver divergent, you started to have wind neurological symptoms. They're more minor. Then at the stomach and the spleen, you start to have wind phlegm symptoms. They become more neurological, right? But they, the extent of severity here in the level of the small intestine and the heart is not the same. Much more severe neurological symptoms. This is where a lot of the real, real hardcore neurological symptoms you're seeing are really kicking off, right? So COVID-19 patients can exhibit here in the stage encephalitis, stroke, and consciousness impairment, often referred to by many people through primary channels as what? Yang Ming, heat Yang Ming, or heat in the pericardium. In divergent channel thinking, we would say this is a pathogen in the, um, in the heart level of divergence. And so you're treating that. So I'm gonna, so this is my idea why you can use a divergence to see this. You can see that it's entered the small intestine heart. As a small intestine divergent declines, it loses its ability to bring blood to the sinews. Now remember, whatever blood is left, the small intestine is trying to move it through the back channels to the sinews, right? Small intestine 10, small, all, along, the, along the scapula and whatnot. But as the gallbladder and liver have declined earlier and your blood is now fairly weak, any blood that's left over, and now the small intestine is having to deal with a pathogen, any blood that's left over, it can't maintain both jobs, right? So what happens is now you're going to start to see excessive neuromuscular issues because you already have a decline in blood from gallbladder liver. And now you have the ability for the small intestine to use the, whatever remaining blood is in there to get to the, to get to the uh, sinews and muscles and whatnot in, the, in the, the neuromuscular system. That's declining because there's so much heat and it's also affecting the yeah, which helped to nourish the marrow and the neurological symptoms you're going to start to see severe physiological issues. So as a drop in nourishment to the sinews begins to happen, neuromuscular issues occur. Musculoskeletal and neurological issues decline as the yeah is burned up and tries to translocate the pathogen in an attempt to save the person, you're going to see severe, severe things. Um, the channel's upper confluence. So the upper confluence points are the points that you needle first to open the divergence, to tell the body we're using a divergent channel, we're not using primaries, right, or whatever channel, lows or whatever. So these th these confluent points are based on whether you want to bring something up and out of the body or down into the body, but you always needle them first in, a, in an order, and we'll go over that later. Um, the channels, uh, the small intestine and heart's upper confluence is bladder one, just like stomach and spleen. So what, but this pathogenic heat is so strong, it can enter the brain here because there's no yin to kind of hold it away. So this in long-term, so in long-term patients, the yin can become deficient and cannot nourish now because the, the yin will move in bladder one into the brain. So not only can the pathogen move into the brain, but maybe it's not in the brain, but maybe the yin can't nourish the brain, right? So you could have one or two symptoms. So in that case, you're going to have, you know, cognitive and neuro serious, like neurological declines in this case. 
Um, so you've got like what I listed here, mania, delirium, encephalitis, all these conditions start to occur. SARS COVID patients have had significant decreases. Oh, this is what I had said before. They have significant decreases in, in the ability to create um, immunity. And you can read that here. I won't get into that. Alternative, you can do bladder two. Some people will do that. I personally think bladder one is a very powerful point. For those who don't know this historically, bladder one was originally known as Ming Men. Ming Men instead of do four Ming Men, which today we call this Jing Ming. Bladder one was originally referred to as Ming Men. It was the Ming men of early acupuncture. To keep that in mind, why it's so powerful. So I would strongly suggest if you're not comfortable with it, become comfortable with it. You know, it's, it's part of your repertoire. It's part of you as a doctor of acupuncture, being able to use it. It's really an important point. Bladder two, though, can be an alternative, but it really doesn't have the same strong effect. All right, so now we're on to the San Jiao. How are we doing for time? All right, so, um, so uh, for those who are afraid to needle at mania and delirium, first you clear heat to calm them down, and then you needle that. So if you're worried about that, what you can do is you can bleed. Remember we talked about before, large intestine 11, large intestine 4. Bleed. Remember, be really creative with your thought process. You have an insane medicine with so many options. Bleed, stomach 36. Bleed, um... Bleed 214. I'll give you a short story of something I saw happen in Beijing. I had a patient of mine who had um, acute, um, he had uh, paranoid schizophrenia. He was, he was, uh, he was, he had a lot of problems. Uh, he had stopped taking his lithium. He was a foreign exchange student and he was having multiple personalities and schizophrenic disorders. Um, and, uh, and we were treating with acupuncture and it was actually helping to pull him out of a catatonic state, but it wasn't enough because I couldn't see him enough. Again, dosage, back to dosage. And his mom, who had flown in from their country, was feeding him fried food, which is what? Exacerbating the this heat, right? This heat in the heart that was going on. It was creating delirium. So um, at one point in time, because we didn't have enough people to deal with him at home, because and they weren't bringing him on a daily basis, even though I'd asked him to, um, they brought him into a, they finally admitted him to a Chinese psycho, uh, like a mental ward in Beijing. And the very interesting thing is because he was he was very, very, very delirious. And he had severe, severe schizophrenia. Um, it was even to the point of uh, uh, psychosis, right? He was talking in multiple voices. He was very violent. He would clam up and he would urinate himself, all these things. They went in to do blood tests because in China they do a lot of blood tests. And they remove a lot of vials of blood. They bled the Hussey point for pericardium and pulled out two full vials of blood. And he immediately snapped into normality. Why? Why did he snap into normality? Because they cleared heat. They bled him enough out of the Hussey point to clear heat. And immediately he knew where he was. Once those vials started coming out, he just knew it. He was like, oh, hey, he starts talking normal again. All these things happen. So remember, clearing heat from the blood is really important. So if you have to start off by, clear, by bleeding the person to calm them down so you can then needle bladder one, then that's what you do. Right? You, you can do that. You have, it doesn't have, again, this medicine isn't like, oh, it's only done like this and it's only done like that. No, it's, it's very fluid. You have to just understand how you're working it together. Um, so, so San Jiao. San Jiao level is deficient in fluids and urine. Lots of hot and dry symptoms. So now we've gone beyond the idea of, of yin. We no longer have it. Now we've just got, we no longer have fluids. We only have qi. Now qi is yin and yang. So we have the yin aspect of qi, but what? That's really ethereal. That's not going to hold anything down. And heat is going to burn right through that, right? So you've got lots of hot and dry symptoms now. You've got a dry nose, dry mouth. Remember, because the stomach can't ascend any sort of um, fluids to the mouth, can't ascend any sort of fluids to the eyes anymore. We're beyond that point, right? And now you've got, now not only do you not have fluids, now you've just got heat barreling out of control. Um, so uh, so you've got you got dry nose, dry mouth, inability to swallow, loss of appetite. A lot of patients I've seen in this scenario have a strong loss of appetite. And a lot of people think, oh, it's a spleen issue. It's actually a, you treat them at this level and they suddenly get their appetite back because it's a level of the San Jiao not able to move qi, just not having enough qi to want to digest and move things around the body, right? You have a severe soreness and achiness throughout the whole body tightness and constriction throughout the whole body because there's heat trying to get out and the body's trying to hold it in and keep it from spreading, right? So acute patients will often sit in a crumpled manner gasping for breath. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen, again, I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of COVID patients. Um, 
because if you're educated in Chinese medicine, you should take your responsibility level as that of a doctor. You, you owe it to people because you went through Chinese medical school and you took the oath to save lives. You go in there, you got to get it done. So you see them gasping and you see them all down on the couch. Like I said, they look like they got hit by a car many times and they're gasping. They can't breathe very well. That everything hurts. Everything's constricting. San Jiao level, at least, at least, right? Because remember, every level is, is continually worse. Um, so what happens is you get uh, Shen disturbances. You can get irritability. You get restlessness. This is very common. Oftentimes, COVID patients will be very, very antsy. Even though they're like, <gasps> they'll be, you'll notice that they're fidgety. They're constantly moving their hands. They start tapping their feet. They do all these things in, in this level. They don't want to sit still, right? It's, it's particularly at this level that you'll see it. And that's one of the ways that you know if you're seeing all of these symptoms together, lots of hotness, lots of dryness, loss of appetite, severe soreness in the body. They don't want to move. But their hands are fidgety. Not like shaking, but like fidgety. They keep touching stuff. They keep tapping their feet like incessantly. Impatient movements. These are all symptoms of it being in the Sanjiao level. Um, so the tongue can be retracted. It's difficult to stick out. So they'll be like, because it's dry. The fluids don't come to the tongue. It's this heat. It's all curled up. So you want to try to get them to open up as much as possible to see. But again, being that as a symptom, you, you're starting to see, oh, look, San Jiao, we have no more yin. We have nothing. We just have qi left. And the qi is being burned through, so they're qi deficient, right? So neuropathy already is, um, has already set in in the previous one. So now the qi is being burnt up because you don't even have yin in the sense of like the fluids. So being able to lift the arms is not so – you'll see a lot of slumpness and a lot of exhaustion in this level. And not just people with bad postures. I mean, I have patients who have phenomenal posture. I have one patient, the one I wrote the case study on, which one of you may have seen. She has phenomenal posture. She's a teacher. She is really, once she got out of this level, once I retreated her and she was out of this level, she went from this to this. In fact, when the treatment was done, she was sitting straight. She was, oh my God, my posture is back. That's really important to understand that if you're treating people, ask them about their posture. Are they normally slumpers or are they not normally slumpers? Because if they're not, you're seeing these symptoms and you're seeing them slump, you've got a Sanjiao divergent issue, you know? All right, so next one, pericardium divergent. So the pericardium divergent, um, the heat has gotten worse and worse. So even, even worse as the yin qi is completely consumed. Remember, because this is more extreme than the Sanjiao. Now you've got to the point where the, where the Sanjiao, the, the yin qi has been completely, completely consumed. And so you have to, you don't even have the ability when you keep these people are often not just drinking, they're drinking cold water, they're drinking ice water, which is not going to be good for them because it's just going to cause more constriction, right? So when you have this question here, what about keeping individual properly hydrated so their mouth and throat are not allowed to become dry? They can make that they can make that attempt. However, most times when you see COVID and these symptoms, it's going to be that severe. They can drink as much water as they want, they're still going to be dry. Why? Because they're yin deficient internally, right? And they're oftentimes going to be drinking a lot of ice cold water. Ice water, ice water, ice water, ice water, anything to cool down. Um, that's because there's incessant heat. So you want to, you would, I would do, um, you can do fluids, you can do water, but I would not do ice water. And I would actually support things that help to clear heat. Um, so uh, you could do herbal formulas. However, what I'll try to do is I'll oftentimes try to push my patients towards things like um, uh, basic, basic like water or things with a little bit of salt in it to tonify the kidneys so they absorb better some lime in the water while they're doing it with no ice, these things to hold on to everything, right? And then there are formulas, obviously, you can use if you want to do that. But today we're talking from an acupuncture perspective. Because to be honest with you, I treat a lot of patients I see face-to-face -face just with acupuncture, just to show people that acupuncture can work alone. Um, and it works just as fast, you know, especially if they can, especially if you're getting dosage of treatment. We'll, we'll go over that. Um, so at this point, yin chi is completely consumed. Arms and wrists hurt. Chest is fullness. Ribs, this is just all sore and full. Yeah, warm water is okay. Warm water is okay. So you have all of this is just full. That restlessness gets worse. They can't sit still. Even though they can't move, they're, 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 they're moving around, right? Um, palpitations increase. They're going to see a lot more. They're going to complain about their heart. They're going to talk about it. They can possibly see that you're going to start to have even more heart pathology occur. So they didn't catch a heart attack before. They can catch one now. Why? Because the heat is now moving to the pericardium divergent, which will zone in the pericardium. This is where you're going to see severe delirium. Whereas before, when you had some crazy dreams and some mania, it comes and goes. At this point, you're going to have some pretty severe delirium. 
Um, oftentimes, when you see high fevers, if some of you have treated patients who are also getting hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine also induces delirium. Now, if you're taking that, if a patient takes that, like I've had patients who have gone to the hospital in this level or in the next level, the last level, they take the hydroxychloroquine, it exacerbates a delirium. Um, it oftentimes, in many patients, actually does, if they're at this level, does push it out of the body as long as they don't have heart issues and this or that. Um, but they'll say, they'll tell me that their delirium was so bad, they just started hearing things that weren't there. They started feeling movements in their body when they would turn. You know, they would feel like another body inside them, like an egg yolk would turn. They get very irritable, you know, because it can add to the delirium. That's part of the side effects of hydroxychloroquine. And so if you're in this stage, it can exacerbate the mental state. Um, hot palms. You're going to notice this. This is very interesting. COVID patients, they might feel like they have heat here, and the rest of their body is kind of cold. But they're going to say, oh, my palms are hot. My feet feel hot. Moving down to the hands, particularly the hands, and more than the feet, the palms are going to be hot because the pericardium channel going to the hands. So why? Because the heat is trying to move outwards. The pericardium and the sanjiao are trying to keep it to move where? The last place they want it to move now, because it's moved all over and it's getting into the zangfu, they want it to keep it from the bowels. That's the last place now they want to keep it. Because that means the idea of the bowels is deep inside the body. So if that heat gets to the hands, it's trying to, oh, it's trying to push it out to the hands, to get it out of the body. Remember, anything you can do, last resort, you know, like a, like a, you know, they're, they, they know they're failing their mission, but they're trying to do whatever they can to just keep you alive as long as possible. That's the whole point here. Uh, yes, you could use lemon or lime and water. Those things will help you to, to absorb. Um, when we have another one. Uh, happen when patients become cold, lower extremities, I'm thinking yin chow. Feel some heat above. Well, again, this is heat below and above, right? So you want to look and see what stage he's in. Um, or a she, or whoever the patient is. Electrolytes. Yes, I would suggest if you're talking about electrolytes for uh, for drinking, you can do things like um, pear, pear juice, and I would cut it half and half with mineral water. It's a very good source of electrolytes. Um, and they can drink that, and it will also nourish the yin of the lungs. So it's a very, very good thing to nourish the yin of the lungs. Uh, another formula that we use in Beijing that we do a lot is, is pear, Ying or Ying Er, the white woody or mushroom, and goji berries. And then you can even put in, I've seen some people put in chrysanthemum flowers, the juha, to help create a cooling and yin nourishing formula that you can eat to nourish the lungs. It's really good. You can put in a little rock sugar. These things are good. However, at this stage, people aren't going to really want to eat. So, but you can do it and you can try to get people at other stages or as you're convalescing back, you can do that. That's a very common formula. Um, so, all right, let's go to the next slide. Um, so the last two confluences, this is, this is like, this is very, 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 very severe. Um, so the last two confluences are unable to hold latency. At this point, there's nothing. You don't even have, you had chi in the last one, which had a little bit of yin. You have no yin. You just have yang now. So the body here doesn't have physiological fluids to use at all. They're useless. Anywhere they are, they can't access those forces, those resources. Um, not, not very well to treat the pathogen. Um, and the pathogen now is just burning out of control, right? So the pathogen here starts to enter the organs, significantly enter the organs now, and the jing lu in the and the primary channels, and it just it just spreads. The pathogen starts to um, here we see the same symptomology as the jing lu definitively. So you're going to see, oh look, we have all these lung symptoms. Oh look, we have large intestine symptoms because there's no way to hold it away anymore. Um, so this intense inflammation is an internal fire, and it's heat signs. And it starts rising critically, and it gets really, really bad. Now, I just want to say in the last one, San Zhao, I'm going to jump back here for a second. Um, in the San Zhao, the San Zhao channel starts here. Now, what I didn't write in these notes, but I wrote in my channel, of uh, my case study, is that the, the San Zhao will try to translocate the pathogen from due 20 down the body. And as a, in the process of this, you have so much dampness and phlegm in the chest that as this pathogen gets down here, you end up developing a condition which is like a viral or bacterial pneumonia condition. It's so strong that antibiotics aren't treating it. Viral treatments aren't working well. It's just spreading and it's getting worse. That's a San Zhao level pneumonia. That's a San Zhao level divergent pneumonia. And what's that? That's a COVID pneumonia. So keep that in mind. That's the level you treat that at. Um, so, uh, so you have this intense heat now. We're in the lung large intestine, the large intestine lung. So we oftentimes see COVID patients, they have gotten sick, they seem to get better, then they enter an intermediary stage, right? Then suddenly they take a massive dive. 
right? They take a very dangerous downturn. That's because the body in its first wave made the effort with the failing weight sheet to redirect the pathogen, as I had said before. But now it's not working. And oftentimes at this point, you get very severe, you, you can bust through the last three divergence, the small intestine part, the Sanjiao pericardium, and it can enter the large intestine lung pretty quickly. So, um, so symptoms now are going to seem all over the map. You're going to see this symptom and that symptom and all these different symptoms everywhere. Um, at the, um, at the Sanjiao and pericardium, that's when the pathogen starts to express outwards in the body. The body can't hold on to it anymore. There's no physiological yin. That's why you see it in the hands. You start to see this heat just emanate out from the body, which is much stronger than anything else. Um, uh, so the pathogenic factor is winning. So the Sanjiao, as I said, the Sanjiao channel, as it moves down, you can see toxic shock, toxic heat moving in large expression as the pathogen is translocated from Dew 20 down in the body to try to move it somewhere else, right? We're trying to keep moving. We're playing this game of musical chairs. We're trying to keep it away from things, right? But the problem is it's like radiation. You have a fallout because it's a battling of the way and the um, the way and the uh, and the pathogen. So uh, so you can have at this point you can have yang collapse. Many 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 people will faint. They'll go into critical condition. I've had a number of patients who just they they just faint and they have to be revived. You know this is before oftentimes I get to them, and that's one of the symptoms why I get called in, right? Um, so as the pathogen moves into the pericardium channel, you have this heat spreading. It spreads out to the gene wells and the palms. It's why you have that. Um, the body's ability to create chi and blood are severely compromised now. And the heat actually enters the blood because it can't keep it away. It can't divide up its resources. Don't use some blood to keep the heat away. So it enters the blood. And now you've got hemorrhaging. You've got severe hemorrhaging in the pericardium level, um, which is another symptom seen in what? Acute cold in critical stages. All right, let's go to the large intestine divergent. Again, these notes will be available so you guys can use them and you guys can contact me for more information. Maybe uh, if Don is interested, we'll do another one of these one time. But all right, large intestine divergent always includes chest symptoms. Remember that. You're always going to have chest and flank fullness. You're going to have a full feeling at this point that lungs are going to feel hot in the person. Heat is consuming the chi. The person's going to be panting. When you get this, you'll have the person. They're, not, they're sitting there. They're not doing anything. They're. Why? There's no yin chi. They can't calm down. The yang is expressing. The heat is expressing, expressing, expressing. It's burning. It's burning everything. Also, you can have deafness. And if you guys aren't aware, there are a minor number of COVID patients who have gone through COVID and they've ended up with deafness. And they don't seem to know why. Why? Because a pathogen moves into the large intestine divergent and ends up entering the ear. That's why. Like I said, Chinese medicine it explains it all. Um, oh, let's go back. Uh, Lung. Lung divergent is the final divergent in the system. At this point, you're going to see a COVID patient that will probably be near death, right? Or is in a severe condition that they could very well die at this point if they haven't had complicating issues already, right? Um, so you've got symptoms with a chest fullness, panting, wheezing, rapid, uh, rapid breathlessness, restlessness, obviously because there's a lot of heat. There's no yin. There's even less yang chi than the large intestine level. Um, so this can't help the pathogen stay out of the Zongfu or out of the, channel, the primary channels it's in them. This is where you get severe organ breakdown. So when you start seeing rhabdomyolysis and organ breakdown, and people are like, oh my God, what's COVID doing? This is crazy. It's a lung divergent. Treat it. You treat it, the person will most likely get better. I can guarantee you that you're going to see improvements as long as you treat correctly and with the right dose. You're going to see coughing. You're going to see, you're going to see coughing that could, uh, that could be phlegm and blood or both in this level. Um, all right, at the point of the large intestine lung divergent, you have a heat storm, a massive heat storm. This is, this is it could be considered, like I said, a cytokine storm, but again, cytokine is multiple levels, right? So the, when the pathogen progresses and enters into the large intestine divergent, you have massive inflammation, which is flooding the lungs and becoming rampant. So at this level, the large intestine and the lung. At this point, the heat has consumed things. Again, this is all just a review. So you're always hot. The patient has no yin. They are only left with yang. The person will feel heat in the lungs, in the chest, like a burning heat, like an irritating heat. They have chest and flank fullness. Again, we're just repeating so you guys know this. Um, also, other symptoms are pathogenic heat or deafness in the large intestine. Um, 
when the pathology enters the level of the lung divergence, the patient has no more latency. The, you're, you're looking at a last stand at this point. Literally, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not mincing my words here. You're looking at a last stand. And it, they're either going to eke out of this because, thankfully, they were able to keep the pathogen away. Even if all the severe things they went through, they were able to eke out of this. Or they could die. Or you're going to be treating them. That's that's it. Those are the only symptoms. Right? Or they, those are the only possibilities, right? So this chest fullness is creating this oppression and severe cough. The patient in the lung divergent will have a nonstop severe cough, just really, really nonstop, and gasping for air and severe cough. And every time they cough, they gasp for air, and it just keeps going and going and going and going and going. And this is where you get the pneumonia that is so severe, they end up in respiratory failure. So this is your intubation stage, your severe, severe intubation stage where the person has been going on and on and on. This is where, um, this is where uh, you would see that. Uh, this is also where we finally see direct cardiac failure from pathogenic heat. So you could have seen things before, but this is where if it survived till now, well, then in the large, uh, the lung divergent, if it doesn't get stopped, you're going to see it directly attacking the lungs, not, I mean, directly attacking the heart, not necessarily by a clot or anything like that. Organs are breaking down. That's why another reason why you're seeing direct cardiac failure. You're seeing rhabdomyolysis and muscle tissue breaking down. You're seeing kidney failure due to the rhabdomyolysis. Uh, why? Because this heat is breaking down things and it's clogging the kidneys. And now you're getting anything that the kidneys have left to work in their semi-normal physiological function is being damaged by the proteins being broken down from the muscles, from the, or, uh, from the organs, and the, and the, um, from the, the proteins from the muscles and the organs. So you're going to have damage to the kidneys. Um, so, so this is something, so this is, you're going to see kidney failure. This is all in the lung uh, divergent level. So remember, the lungs make an early effort. This is a review from before. They make an early effort to descend the pathogenic factor to the bladder to urinate it out if they're unable to sweat it out. This can be seen starting at Taiyang of the primary channel in a physiological and a pathophysiological state. For patients in the large intestine and lung stage, they are usually unable to sweat. And so an effort can be made to urinate out as much as possible. However, in, if the Taiyang channel is blocked, and due to dampness or something else associated to the, the, uh, the pathogen or the person having a damaged bladder or having surgery in that area, obstructions in the lower jowl, blah, 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 the pathogen will become blocked in the urinary tract and you're going to get pain, even more pain. And this could be associated with what? The within the five strangular area, right? Like the, the ideas of, of, um, of pathogenic factors with blood. You can have patients with urinate blood. You can have patients who urinate stones or, or cloudy urine. So those things are to take, you will see that as rhabdomyolysis, as things break down, you're going to see a number of these things happen in the person's urine, right? You're at the level of the lung divergent. You can treat that. A reminder, I want to remind you guys, once the pathogen is past the three confluence, the three first ones, again, I, I got to beat this in the head so that you guys remember, it will no longer, it can no longer be expelled exteriorly. It can't be coughed out. So once it gets past the bladder, kidney, gallbladder, liver, stomach, spleen, you can't get it out exterior, exteriorly anymore. You have to support the next three confluences, small intestine, heart, uh, the sanjiao pericardium, and the a large intestine, lung, to push it back up and out. And then you can use the upper confluences, the upper divergence to clear it out, right? So the COVID patient in this case can't cough it out. It can't clear it through the exterior. So all the coughing in the lung diversion is just in vain. At this point, it's not the body coughing. It's, it's just the pathogen and the reaction of the body because it can't stop, right? The tightening of the spasming and everything now is no longer a physiological or a pathophysiological function in the sense of the body trying to keep it out so much as it just can't do anything. It's just coughing, 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 right? Um, patients with burning mouth, well, this would be heat, like we talked about on the Sanjay level, you know? So you can, you can see that with the dryness of the mouth, super, super, super dry and hot. Um, so now this is different. This idea of this tightening is different than a Xiaoyang tightening, right? The Xiao, uh, in this case, this, you have a severe pneumonia stage. That's not Xiaoyang. And this is what causes that severe chest pain in those acute pneumonia stages when they're in the lung, large intestine. They're so, so tight. And it's because it's trying to do its last best effort to secure any pathogenic heat it can here or wind or cold or dampness or whatever you're looking at from moving into the bowels. Because if it moves into the bowels, you're pretty much done, right? So with this tightness, it creates B, obstruction. 
and what's going to happen is it can possibly push it out to the joints, push it out to the limbs. And this is where you get start to get B obstruction in the limbs while they're having acute COVID. You know, and, and it can go in the head, it can go, it can go into the limbs, it can go to all these different things. It's just tightening, right? It can even go to the abdomen, but trying to keep it out of the bowels, it's just tightening. And you can find a lingering B obstruction with COVID patients who went through these acute symptoms due to this later on in the recovery stage, and you would want to treat that, right? All right. I know we're running low on time. I'm going to try to get through as much as I can. Um, I don't know if Donna wants to go over or not, but Donna, just stop me when you want to stop me. Um, uh, tightening at this stage, remember, a severe chest stagnation um, seen in all acute COVID patients. This also includes blood stasis, right? You're going to get a lot of COVID patients to see purple in and around the area of the lung and the heart. This blood stasis is occurring in their acute level. It's tightening everything down in this large intestine lung stage. Um, so you're going to see fluid stasis. You're going to see heat stasis. This is a result of cheese stagnation transforming to heat. You're going to even see food stasis if they're eating, right? But at different levels, you can see these things. So, like, for example, you can see food stasis at the uh, stomach and spleen level. You can see it at the small intestine heart level. You can see it even at the sanjao pericardium level. They're probably not going to be eating much better. Um, in an effort to stagnate the, par uh, the pathogen, if this fails, this tightening fails, then what happens is it'll move to the bowels. And that's when you get, suddenly you get drum distension. Now, for a lot of you guys who may not know this, because it's not talked about, there's a lot of things that happen in diagnoses and diagnoses um, and even symptoms that are taken down and charted in Western hospitals that aren't really released because they don't know where they, how they fit in the puzzle. But I can tell you, because I, I treat and I work with nurses and doctors, that a couple of them, have, I've asked them some of these things based on divergent channels when I was kind of realizing this theory, and they were like, you're right. So one of the things is, if this thing, you fail in the lung, or the lung divergent to keep this thing from going into the bowels, what happens is your stomach will then, your abdomen will then swell. Well, you know what happens to acute COVID patients who are intubated, a lot of them? They're, they do these MRIs in their stomachs, they're all full of gas. Just fully, and they don't know why, they haven't eaten in weeks, or, you know, a week or more. They're like, why are they full of gas? This makes no sense. Because the pathogen makes its way out of the lungs, down into the abdomen. It's not something you're going to hear on the news, but it's something you hear from doctors and nurses who work in COVID units, um, especially ones who are, where people are intubated. That's something that you'll see, um, this drum-like distension. Um, so I've, I've talked to a number of uh, different people working there, and they've all said that, yeah. Um, if the person is predominantly damp, you'll also have feelings of heaviness in this. They just can't move, and they're constricted. They're very heavy. If there's constriction of the abdomen due to cold, um, then the patient can also have abdominal fullness and pain. Versus if it's just gassy, they might not have pain. But if it's cold, it's starting to develop. Why? Because the heat is burning everything out, right? At this point, heat is burning. It's like it's like a house. When you light a house on fire, you have heat for a while. But then as the fire starts to go out, what? The house can't maintain its own heat. It gets cold as it cools down, right? You just have the, the, the leftover structure, and it can't maintain heat. It doesn't have four walls to maintain insulation to maintain heat anymore. So it starts to develop. It starts to become very cold. The body can do that after the heat burns it out, right? So the patients at this level, lung, large intestine, or large intestine, lung, even pericardium sanjao, if they aren't ventilated or intubated by this point in time, they most likely will be unless they get help and get help fast. And I mean Chinese medicine. That's what I mean. I mean acupuncture and Chinese medicine. If they're not intubated already, then you can keep them from being intubated by treating them, by treating them effectively and by treating them with the right dosage. And that's what's really, really important. All right, so what to do. Now we're to the what to do part. Now we've gotten through all that. Recognize the channel progression so one can better understand channel um, pathogenic progression. The first three confluences can be cleared through the surface. However, the lower ones cannot. So you need to consolidate the lower ones to push it up and then clear out through the upper ones. Um, Treatment in divergent channels can include many needling techniques, such as shaking, vibrating, lifting, and thrusting, looping, methods, etc. For the sake of keeping this simple, for those who might not be exceptionally experienced in treating the divergence, we will keep this basic to what you can use and start using in the clinic that will have success without much time getting good at it. So in uh, divergent channels, we call it three-time needling. Right, and so this three-time needling is oftentimes referred to as superficial, deep, superficial, or we call it SDS, or deep, superficial, deep, DSD. 
So for those who aren't familiar with this, superficial deep superficial needling, SDS needling, pulls a pathogen out to the surface to express it out and to expel it outwards. How does it do that? It rouses the person's resources, the substantia of the yin, the jing, the blood, the fluids, to move the pathogen out and invigorate it towards the surface. So think about this. You have blood will move wind, fluids move phlegm, right? So you're going to move these things, right? So why, why because as, we, as blood declines, you can get wind. But if you can rouse blood together, it can move wind to the surface, right? As fluids decline, you tend to get dampness and phlegm. But if you can, if you can consolidate the fluids, you can clear the phlegm. So this is the idea of these needling techniques. Um, so DSD needling assists the body in both consolidation and consol consolidating the resources needed to, to assist the body putting the um, pathogen in latency, but also to strengthen and support the general um, the general physiological function of the body when you're not dealing with a pathogen. Right? So if a person is deficient in yin, and would be unable to push out the pathogen due to their deficiencies, this could, ha this could occur in the upper three confluences, but is nearly all, always the case in the lower three. You would then consolidate. You consolidate to hold this in, to bring all the resources in the body to do this one thing. And I'm going to explain, I'm going to give you a metaphor for what it's kind of like in a bit so you understand. When you're dealing with the lower three confluences, small intestine, heart, sanjiao, pericardium, large intestine, lung, you're consolidating you're not going to be able to express COVID out from that level. You need to consolidate, and then you'll start, as you notice, you'll notice the symptoms change, and they get better, they move up, they move to um, the upper confluences. Then you can start to clear from there. So when a game plan is decided upon, based on the correct diagnosis, the needling is done in accordance with whether you want to pull it out, whether you can pull it out, is it in that surface, or whether you have to push it in latency and consolidate fluids to try to push it up or hold it in latency until the person can revive. With SDS needling, the person needs the way level, or needles to the way level, vibrates the, the needle to obtain chi. Then the needle is driven to the deep level, to the yuan level. Um, and so you would needle in, if you're in and around a bone or a joint, you would needle into that bone or joint um, to, a, to a fairly deep level. Then you vibrate at the deep level to basically, if you start at the surface, you're calling the way chi. Then you go to the deep level, and you vibrate, you're calling your NG and the Wei Qi together that's being attacking the pathogen, and you're coming back out to the surface to pull that back out to the surface to express. Right? So that's why you're vibrating to call out your NG that's holding it in stasis to bring that Wei Qi together to come back out to the weight level. The, the, um, the needle is then pulled back out to the weight level, as I said, and this is generally done with the upper, con uh, upper and lower confluence. Uh, the technique is generally done on the upper and lower confluence points that open that channel. So what do I mean by that? Bladder kidney, upper and lower confluence points, bladder 10, bladder 40. You want to at least use that needling technique if you're going to be pulling things out on those two confluence. You can do them on points in between, but you don't have to, but those very specifically are important. Now, when you needle SDS, you then follow up by needling the jing well, we'll get into that. Um, so, with SDS, of the first three confluences, gua sha and cupping of the cutaneous vessels associated with the yang pair divergent is really kind of important. So, you, you'll get all the points. The points will be later on. You'll see them. It's all in the, trust me, this is 91 slides, and I'm not going to go over a lot of it. I wrote this all two afternoons ago, just like in an afternoon. So, you'll have a lot of information. Um, so, if you are treating to pull out a pathogen and things aren't coming out, and the person, but the person has adequate yin to push it out. But what you want to think about is maybe they're holding. They're holding in an area that's very, that's very kind of um, uh, substantive, like around the neck or around the back, around the front or around the waist. So what are these? These are the cutaneous vessels, right? You want to palpate the five axes of the body to look for holding places. You'll find on COVID patients, the SCM, especially around Sanjiao 16, is very tight as they're trying to hold things down. So... You may, not in the lower confluence, not in the lower um, divergence, not in uh, small intestine part or sanjiao pericardium or large intestine lung, but as you get up more, you might want to gua sha this. Gua sha the SCM, gua sha the diaphragm, maybe cup the diaphragm, massage it, abdominus rectus. Again, diaphragm, you start in the back, you know, go shoe bladder 17 and come around the front, all the way under the breast and the chest to the front. This will really help to release the diaphragm, clear things out. 
right? Iliosoas around the waist. This is Xiaoyang. SCM here. This is all. Um, this all this here is all the Yangming. This collar is Yangming. Here, Taiyang, right? And then down here around the waist, Iliosoas, and around the front. This is all Xiaoyang, right? So if you're going to be releasing Taiyang bladder kidney, wash off from the back to the front. If you're going to be releasing Yangming, wash out of the collar along the SEM down here, down to summit 12. If you're going to be coming along, if you're going to be doing Xiaoyang, you're going to do down or along the waist around what? Dai Mai, because Dai Mai connects to Xiaoyang. Does that make sense? So um, you can cup, uh, cupping. So here's a deal, and that's a good question. So Gua Sha generally releases more heat than cupping. Cupping goes deeper and pulls out more cold. However, you can use cupping. Um, you might find, though, if the heat is more on the surface of the body, you might want to Gua Sha instead. But, you know, try it out, see what works best for you. Um, the pair of vertebrals, see if they're tight. Palpate them. One of the things I find in COVID patients is they, they this is going to sound wild, but I've had COVID patients who form a shark fin on their back. They get the muscles of the pair of vertebrals get so tight that it, it comes up like this. And it's normally from Glishu all the way up to the middle of the back. Wash out that area, right? And open that up. You'll see this tightening. Get that up. That'll be very important. The shark fin I found in COVID pain, I call it a shark fin. It kind of looks like a fin, the way the way it kind of comes up on a shape like this. And you wash out of that and you're needling, you get really good results, but that could be a holding, right? And the other one is a glutes. So you might want to um, you might want to wash out of these things. All right. Um, so I go through in this a little bit how to treat SDS, needling the lower confluence first. So you start with the lower confluent points, and then you needle the upper confluent points with the SDS, I'm sorry, SDS needling. And then you would needle um, the Jingwell associated with that divergent chain. You can go, guys, go through this a little bit later. Let's try to fast forward a bit. All right. Um, so we went over this. I talked about this. Let's keep going. Again, I wrote this out so that you guys will not try. You, you guys will have as clear of an understanding as I could to write in an afternoon. Um, so DSD needling is if the patient is too deficient and could not expel the pathogen. This will be used for somebody in an extre extremely acute case or you, where you need to stabilize the person's symptoms immediately. You just got to bring everything together. So also this would be used in the lower three um, divergent channels. The lower three divergent confluence is the uh, pairs, right? So because there's not enough yin to hold on to things, right? Um, so you want to move the pathology out of the body. Uh, so you want to hold it so that later maybe you can move the pathology out, but you can't do it right now. So you consolidate. So what you want to do is you want to consolidate so that eventually your body can push up to the upper three confluences. So DSD needling involves the physician, you, the Chinese medical physician, the acupuncturist, needling to the yuan level, fairly deep. You vibrate. You gather the, the jing, the yuan qi there, which is thick and viscous, right? Then you pull it to the surface. You vibrate so it attaches to the wave that's interacting with the pathogen on the surface. And then when you obtain the qi on the surface and vibrating, you drive it back down to the yuan level. This will come deep and down into the body so that it will hold it in the body. You don't require gua sha or cupping for this because remember, you're not releasing out. You don't require needling the ji well because you're not releasing out. So you keep that in mind. All right. So I explained that here. Then um, you would start with this case, whereas coming out of the body with uh, SDS, you start with lower confluence and then upper confluence. DSD, you bring things into the body. You start with the upper confluence, wherever they are, and then you need the lower confluence with that DSD needling. Um, then you would add the points that you would associate. So remember, this is something I want to point out. You're consolidating, right? You're consolidating. You're not tonifying. And this is a clarification. I want you guys to understand. The action of this treatment does not build resources in and of itself. It consolidates the bits and pieces of yin or chi or whatever all over the body. It reorganizes your resources to bring them together to strengthen the body's ability to do this or hold this. You know, or what it needs to do physiologically, pathophysiologically. So the resources in the body um, can then, when they're gathered together, they can then build more fluids, build more blood back because your body can run more efficiently. Um, so, but it's not the direct result of doing DSD. It's the result, the result of reestablishing order, which through consolidation, which then helps the body to 
build these things. But again, what do you need to do? You need to have a person eat right, right? You know, they have to eat better. They have to maybe have herbs. They have to do something else to, uh, if they have to. Now, here, think of this. So this idea of DSD, some people have trouble understanding this. This is the way that, um, this is the way that I would explain it to people. If any of you guys uh, grew up with computers in the 90s, um, a lot of times the computers, they would, they would save information all over a drive, right? They would save it in these different parts of the drive. You might have 50 megabytes left, but you can't use 50 megabytes because it's all separate in all these little pieces. So what did you do? You had to defrag the drive, right? So it could run efficiently. What did that do? It moved things on the drive so that all the memory saved on the drive was here and not here, here, and here. And then all the free memory was here, right? That's consolidation. That's the same idea here in divergence. You're defragging the body or you're making an attempt to defragment things so that then you can use those resources as effective as possible. So think about it like defragmenting an old computer drive. That's essentially what, what's so profound about divergence of DSD is that you're defragmenting it so you can run the body efficiently. All right. So needles are retained for 20 to 60, 25 to 60 minutes, depending on what's going on. SDS, DSD, SDS is generally, um, is generally, uh, uh, DSD is generally held in less than SDS. Remember, because you don't want to drain the person too much. SDS is generally held in more because you're trying to pull them down and disperse them. Um, and, uh, and also it takes Jing a while to move, right? You come up and out. It takes Yuan Qi a while to move. Um, so treatments should be done at least according to classical guidelines. So this is something I want to be very clear about. If you want to be effective with acute patients, at least, at minimum, they need to be done three days of treatment on, and then a three-day break, and then three days of treatment on, and a three-day break. This is no one treatment once a week shit. That type of shit is never going to make yourself stuff real medicine, especially in a condition like this. What you need is you need legitimate dosing, and you need that upfront treatment that's going to be there just as if they were in hospital, right? So what you're going to need is you're going to have to treat the person three days in a row, and then a three-day break, so you don't aggravate the jing too much, generally. Three days in a row, three-day break. So it's nine days of treatment, nine days of no treatment for a total of 18 days. Now, in that 18 days, you're going to be able to see some sort of something going on because you're treating them that much. And for some of you guys think, oh, my God, that's so much. Think about this, and I'm going to talk about this in these slides. Dosage. When somebody takes herbal medicine, they oftentimes take three doses a day, four doses a day. If somebody's taking Western medicine, they're taking three or four doses a day. If they go into the hospital and they're on intubation for the next two weeks, that's 24 hours a day times 14 days of dosage. Or if they're on oxygen for seven days because you chose to treat them once and then they suddenly got worse and you're wondering, well, why did that happen? Because the dosage isn't correct. You need to see these people on a regular basis if you want this to work. So the deal is, this is why acupuncture is so freaking powerful. Because if you treat the person, if you treat the person about, um, if you treat the person with acupuncture, say it's a one hour treatment, say it's a 25 minute treatment, you treat them once a day. You can have resounding results, which can actually even eclipse the results they would have in a day of herbal medicine or, you know, or multiple doses. Let me say multiple doses of herbal medicine. And I'm not talking down about herbal medicine. I just want you to see the comparison. One dose of acupuncture is one treatment. You might require three doses of herbal medicine to get that same result. You might require four, five. Remember, they're taking three doses a day. You give them one a day. So at the end of the day, they're noticing the same results they did from acupuncture as they did from herbal medicine. You gave them one dose. They had to take three of, the, of something else. I have patients who were in the hospital wheezing. They were on a five-day, around-the-clock oxygen tank, right? And they still were having breathing trouble. And they finally went home because the doctors didn't know what to do with them. One dose of acupuncture pulled them out of wheezing. Three doses of acupuncture, guess what? They're up and walking around cleaning their house again. Three doses. They're on oxygen. Five days, around the clock, 24 hours a day. The power of acupuncture compared to the power of these other things is phenomenal. But it's dosage. You have to talk to your patient. Look at your treatments as dosage. If you use that terminology, you'll get through to Western audiences better. That's something I've been doing for a number of years since I ran my clinic. And it's the way that I describe things. And it's far more effective. Um, so dosage is important. So sometimes you find that on three days off of the divergence, you can give them another primary treatment. You can give them treatments in between those three days. So keep that in mind that when you're treating them, okay, you're doing three days on, three days off, three days on, three days off. You can treat them with primaries, you know, on those other three days, and then you can go back to primaries after that. Sometimes if the person's very, very critical, 
I sometimes will continue the DSD treatments for the person a bit beyond the three days. Sometimes I'll do it twice a day just to make sure I've stabilized them, but I don't go so, but I'm, I'm not looking to just rampantly do it. I'm doing it within their symptomology change, right? So like I've, I've spent time treating a patient and I would, I treated them in the morning. I treated them in the afternoon, both with divergence, same treatment. That did light years difference. Why? That's two doses a day, right? So you have a big, 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 um, a big, big way to, um, to affect the person. And it's very strong and it's very fast. Um, whoa, let's just see forward here. Go back. Uh, let me just double check here. All right. So, um, most divergence move up the body. Sanjao and pericardium move down. You can needle in the direction of the divergence if you want. If you're wondering, well, how do I needle? What direction? You, I generally needle vertically, but people can needle in the direction of the divergence as well. Um, uh, channels do not have to be used to, according to pairs. So I want people to understand this. Um, for example, you something a patient you're treating them and they move from the large intestine and lung stage, they move things up to the sanjao pericardium. Well, now you know recovery is beginning to take place, right? So now they're now we see more coughing. Maybe we even see them start to move up into the gallbladder, but they're still having sanjao divergent issues and they're having some gallbladder divergent issues with coughing and more Xiaoyang symptoms rather than the severe tightening of the lungs and large intestine. You can consolidate Sanjiao and you can release SDS gallbladder. So in that case, you would also needle what you would use the different needling technique and you could needle gallbladder 43, 44 to release it. You will have very good results. So you can mix and match them according to what? What the patient is presenting if you have a clear understanding of divergence, right? And this is something that I've done that you don't have to follow them in pairs. You can mix and match depending on the levels because you'll have people, sometimes you'll have a pathogen that's kind of in this level and kind of in this level. It's in this level because it's eaten through the resources and you just need to consolidate it more so it can push it back up. And the pathogen doesn't always follow like one by one by one up. Sometimes it can make jumps, especially if the consolidation is done very well and the person's doing better. The body might skip entire levels to get better, just as they can skip entire levels to get worse. So keep that in mind. Um, so. Uh, so yeah, so um, I give you some more examples here. Uh, but, uh, let's go on to the next thing. So carefully selecting points. So after you've needled the confluences, you want to carefully select the points along the divergent channel that associate with the treatment you're giving. What are the symptoms that are going on? Look carefully at when before you see the patient. If you have symptomology and you think they're in a channel level, look up the channel. Look up all the symptomology that's associated with each of the points. And the path and the pathway of the channel, where those points are over, you know, do they have organ connection? Do they have do they have a subbranch that comes off? All this and that. Take that into consideration because that's going to give you a better idea of what points to use, right? Um, now there are a few off-channel points you can use. Um, anything that's associated with Yuan Qi and Wei Qi, you can oftentimes use with divergence. But you don't want to go too overboard. You don't want to mix too many channels. Channel. You don't want to do like, oh, I'm going to do this little point in this divergent channel system, and then I'm going to do this eight extras, and I'm going to do these primaries. That's too much. That's too much for the body. You're asking it to do too much at once, and it's already deficient. So you don't want to do that. But points you can use that will work along with this would be things that work with the Yuan Qi and the Wei Qi or the Yuan and Wei connection. Plus C points connect with the Yuan Qi. Uh, Yuan source points um, obviously connect with the Yuan Qi. Confluent points of the sinews, the bones, and the marrow obviously connect with the Yuan Qi. Jing well points through SDS what bring things to the Wei Qi. Um, so, yeah. um, so it's very important. This is really, really, really important. I wanted to get this in here. This is stuff that I've realized from, from uh, making this mistake, and I'll never do it again. When you're seeing these COVID patients, when you're seeing them, you're seeing them up front, and you're seeing them face to face, especially if they're in the acute condition, even if they're not, even if they're in a convalescent, you need to see them daily for at least the first week and a half to two weeks. No breaks. I can't make this any more clear. I am dead serious about this. You need to see them daily. Daily, sometimes twice a day, if they're going to be in acute. This is medicine, right? Chinese medicine is medicine. You need to work it like medicine. So you're going to need to see them daily for up to the first week and a half or two to make sure they're out of this. Because oftentimes a patient will feel better and you'll be like, oh, wow, two treatments, man. I did good. This is great. Okay, yeah, you know what? That's a long drive. I'm just going to take a break, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Now what happens is, you know, we'll give them a day off, and then in the middle of the night they'll wake up, 
on the day after they missed the treatment, or maybe two days after because they're feeling so good, with severe stabbing pain. Why? Because they're still fluid deficient. They're still yin deficient. And it normally occurs at night. And it normally occurs in the middle of the night. And then they freak out and they call EMS. They call the EMT. They, they, the hospital, and then they go to the hospital, right? They don't think to call you at three in the morning. You know, they, they're thinking to call the emergency medical services and they get hauled away in an ambulance. And then what? You're shit out of luck because you can't see your patient. They're stuck in the hospital for five, six, seven, eight days a week, two weeks. And now your treatment plan comes to a dead stop. And now they're going to be, well, who knows what they're going to put on? Oxygen, hydroxychloroquine, you know, some other treatment, intubated, you know. You need to maintain regular treatment with these people to get them out of the woods. You don't want to give them a break because they can regress, especially if you just got them out of the acute stage. This is super, super, super important because the yin, because they've, they have this toxic heat and you're starting to consolidate yin and fluids and things in the body. And then, so they start to look better, but then you kind of leave them. And then what happens? Boom. It starts to, that eats right through that yin again. And then they're messed up. You cannot see. So the three day on and three day off is generally just for divergence. But between those three days on and three days off, on those three days off, you need to treat them with something else. Continue the treatment. That's what you need to do. Um, so this is really, really, really important because you, your goal is to keep the patient out of the hospital, out of the ICU. And you want to keep them from breaking treatment. Why? Because it breaks the dosage. You have a dosage set up for the treatment. It's not going to work if the dosage is broken. It's not going to work effectively. You need to make sure this is an acute condition. You know, imagine if you went to the hospital and you're like, all right, doc, I'm only going to take this oxygen for like an hour. I don't want this to be dose. No, no, no. You know you would never do that. Everybody like, hey, hydroxychloroquine, you got to take this. Or antibiotics, you got to take this. And you'd be like, I'm just going to take one or two. Nah, I'm good for it. You know that the infection would come back, right? That's a big thing about like finishing antibiotics and following this dosage routine. Dosage is super important. Dosage is super, super, super important. So as I said before, it's really important. This is an explanation about how dosage, one treatment equals one dosage. This is how powerful acupuncture is. So make sure that you're maintaining the dosage. That's what's going to get things right. The, in the classics, so in ancient China, Chinese medicine wasn't called Chinese medicine. It wasn't called Zhong Yi. It was called Yi. It was just called medicine. So you had more reputable doses. They figured out how the dose worked, and then they used it as such. You've got to go back to that in acute pandemics and things. You, you can't be skipping around. You can't be lazy about this. If your patient has to be in, your patient has to be in. If you have to adjust your prices, if you have to drill your patient, whatever you have to do, this is a life or death thing. This is not, this is not something to fool around about. You need to take this dead seriously. They need to make sure that they're getting regular dosage. So acupuncture affects, I want you guys to know this, acupuncture affects patients in severe stages of pneumonia in COVID in seconds, in minutes. I will send Donna an audio recording of a patient I treated. We needled him. He was gasping. We needled him. He said, ow, and suddenly his breathing was better. It's going to shock you guys. I'm going to send this to Donna so she can put it online so you can hear it. It was that much different. And I had a number of other patients the same thing. Again, needling. It's really, really, really important to understand that. Um, uh, can I connect treating every day with the three days of divergent channels and then three days? Yes. So you might go three days divergent and then three days primary channels. You know what I mean? Sometimes, like I said, sometimes I'll go four or five days with the divergence if they're really in that acute stage because I'm not consolidating enough. But generally, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to... Uh, I don't want to do too much because I don't want to aggravate the jig, right? Um, so it's very important. The one thing that matters is dosage. Are you giving treatment regularly enough? I can't hound this enough. Otherwise, the treatment will end up being sabotaged. And then everybody will be in question of whether the Chinese medicine can work. And let me tell you what, it works incredibly well. All right, so I'm not going to go through these. These are for you guys to go through. I list here a, a whole bunch of the channels. Every single divergent channel, I don't have I don't have pictures in anything. I will strongly suggest if you guys want to know more, I point to Jeffrey Ewan's NISA transcripts. I learned directly from Jeffrey from scratch. Like I actually went to his college when he had his college. I learned right from him. I think he's the best source for this. If you want to learn divergence in his way, go to his stuff. It's out there. I will also suggest vimeo.com, V-I-M-E-O.com. Search Jeffrey Ewan. There's an uh, a there's an acupuncture society in Ireland that videotapes him teaching these channel systems, including divergence. And you can buy them at a steal compared to what it's like to take these classes in person. 
I think the Divergent Channel one is like 170 or 190 dollars. Um, I would get the Nisa transcripts. I would get the Vimeo recordings. I would go to him. I think that's the best. I personally think that's the best resource for, for this as I'm teaching it. You know, um, I learn from him. These are what I've developed from learning from him. But I would go to him and get it. Uh, all right, let's get through all this. Here, um, okay, because I want to I want to just touch on this real quick. Because some of you guys are like, well, what about PPE? Well, what about this and that? You know, so let's um, uh, so let's go through this. So, um, so strengthening the body's immunity through strengthening the spleen and stomach, kidneys and lungs are super important. They're actually more important than your PPE, whatever you're gonna wear. I'm just gonna tell you that straight up. I'm not saying don't wear it. I'm just saying that's gonna be more important because you have plenty of people who wear masks who still catch it. But you have people who have a strong spleen and stomach and kidneys and lungs and they're not catching it and they're around in in um in houses with people with COVID. Why? Well, or even if they do catch it, they don't have any symptoms because it's internal. It's about what's inside. So that's number one. Even before your PPE, the first thing is prevention is what comes from inside of you. This can be done via lifestyle, diet, qigong, and exercise, acupuncture, and moxa. Acumoxa, right? Gen Zhou in Chinese. It's not Gen and Zhou. It's not needle and fire. It's Gen Zhou. Acupuncture, moxa, blushing is one thing, guys. Yeah, one thing. Herbal medicine. A number of herbal formulas have already been talked about. Um, uh, the J windscreen formula can work very well for people who are tie in deficient already, who tend to be susceptible to wind damp invasion. Um, e Lotus through John Chen, they translated a phenomenal pneumonia prevention formula we were using in Beijing when I was still there. And this works very, very well for wind invasions that turn, tend to turn to heat and dampness internally, resulting from COVID expressions uh, marked by pneumonia and severe phlegm. So, this is really good for flu and COVID type symptoms. Basically, basically like external, you know. Um, little gun like these external pathogens that come in, right? So this is what um, this is what you want to use. So these are good if you want to use them for prevention. I also send them to patients. I also have doctors and patients who order them for me nearly biweekly to make sure they never run out and they're working in COVID units. I take them. I take them regularly. You know, I also have them being sent to people who live in houses with COVID patients. Like I have an elderly lady who's like 70 years old. Everyone in her house had COVID. She was on this formula. She didn't get sick. Not a single person I've given these formulas to prior to them coming down with COVID have gotten sick. Only one patient got sick, but they took it after they thought they might have been exposed to it. And so obviously they were already sick with it. But these are prevention formulas, right? Um, so another thing that they touched on in the e Lotus thing that we were using in, in Beijing as well, but I want to talk about this a little more because I modified it and I think it's I think it's a little more successful. Um, Acumoxa, acupuncture moxa, or moxa bushing on points, super, super, super important. To tonify and harmonize spleen, stomach, strengthen the lungs, the ability to diffuse and descend chi, and strengthen the kidneys. Understand, this is just as powerful as herbal medicine. Just because you take a substance inside doesn't mean that the moxa isn't going to be able to do the same thing. You know, so commonly in China, we use a lot of this. So we use these points, the series of points I'll talk about here, we use these points to tonify the earth element. So, so. For example, what is the earth element? It's the mother of the lungs. It's the mother of metal, right? So you, and then what happens is, so we'll use stomach 36, moxa it, tonifies chi, tonifies blood, or nourishes blood and yin, tonifies the stomach and spleen and digestion, transforms dampness. As the Hussey point, it directly affects the stomach, right? It also helps to calm rebellion, right? And being that where, the stomach channel starts where? At Zhong Wan, right? Ren 12, and then ascends, it starts right in the middle of the stomach. So you're going to be able to nourish the stomach via its mother, its mother point, right? So that's a phenomenal, that's the earth of earth, right? It's a Harari point, right? So it's going to be very good at strengthening both the earth and also the lungs. Ren 6, tonifies the chi, the yang, the kidneys, regulates chi and blood. So it also, think about this. What's here at the navel? The navel's here, and Ren 6 is here. What's here? Ming men, right? Directly in back of it. So you're going to have a direct connection back to the kidneys. Right? Not just all, oh, because this point strengthens the kidneys, but think about why it strengthens the kidneys. Because it moves right through, right? It's going to help to strengthen Dumai, the kidneys, Taiyang. It's going to help to strengthen these things. Um, uh, we're going to talk about how we do this technique in a bit. Uh, Ren 12, harmonize the middle jiao. Zhong Wan, harmonize the middle jiao. 
regulates chi. It's the move point of the stomach. It's also where the lung channel begins. So you're going to have this ability to do this. It's going to assist in raising the jing fluids to support the stomach supporting way. And also, at the same time, holding things in, in latency. Uh, but as a prevention, you're supporting the stomach fluids, the yin chi to move up to what? Transform into wei chi, yang chi and wei chi, so that it can help keep the exterior, you know, pathogen out. Tonifying yang chi and firming the exterior is super important to support way, right? This is the point I've added. Do 14. Why? Da jue. Da jue is the great hammer. Do 14. All yang channels meet at this point. This point can expel wind through releasing the exterior. It can strengthen the exterior, clear heat, tonify deficiency, and clinically can be used to assist the tonifying and rousing of yang qi as it rises from the kidneys into tai yang. So, what you'll find is when you moxa, you need to moxa the area sufficiently. So, I would suggest that Tradi well, traditionally, we would use cones, and those cones would go over the area, and you would burn the cone down on the skin, and you get a blister. And that blister was a medically induced blister that would help. Now, with moxa, one of the things that you want to look at is today, a lot of people just go, oh, it's warm, it's warm, move on. No, that's not good enough. What you want to do is hold the moxa over the area. And when the person says, oh, hot, take the moxa away, touch it with your hand, go back and do it again. Eventually, you're going to get to the point where this point is hot immediately. Then it's going to be a quick one. You're going to do this about five minutes, nonstop, on each point. You need this to get hot. Many of my patients did produce small blisters, but I'll tell you what. None of the ones who did moxa ever got COVID. So you want to do this type of moxa. You want to really, really make sure that you're using the moxa correctly. Now, do 14, I use a little bit interesting feedback. With do 14, when you moxa on the area... What you want to do, same idea, you're doing this, but eventually what's going to happen is a person's going to feel a chill go down their spine. It's going to go right down the back, Taiyang, do my, it's going to go right down the back. And they're going to feel maybe like they want to shake their shoulders if they have a shiver. What is that? That's the exterior releasing. That's Taiyang opening. That's the fact that the Yang Chi is moving in and out into the shoulders and the Yang channels and down into Taiyang. And you're opening this up. You could also use this for a wind cold invasion. You get them to shake and shiver. And that shivering that they're feeling, even though they're not cold in this case because you're using moxa, is the opening of the pores in Taiyang, the releasing of the exterior. You know you're tonifying Yang Chi at that point. It's a really good thing that I use in my patients, and it works very well. And like I said, none of those patients have come down with COVID. All right. Um, Recovery. We're going to get through this. I promise. Lingering nature of COVID-19 is directly tied to a person's own constitution, whether they're healthy or unhealthy, pre-COVID, and the severity of the case due to their condition. Patients' post-acute symptoms tend to be very chi deficient on both postnatal chi production and from the spleen stomach and also tie in, and most of them also exhibit kidney deficiency. Many patients you'll see who go into acute symptoms have something that's affecting their kidneys. I've had a number of patients who have been on prednisone excessively over the past weeks and sometimes years. That's, that suppresses and weakens kidney chi. You know, that's going to affect the spleen. You know, all these things are happening because they're trying to reduce internal inflammation from something else and they're compressing kidney yang and then they get COVID and it just like takes over and they go really acute really quick. So you want to think they've already got spleen stomach chi deficiency. They've already got lung and spleen deficiency. So you're going to have to build this back. The most important thing is to build back what? The chi, the blood, the jing in a timely manner. I, in a timely manner. If you build it back in a timely manner, they're going to get better. They're going to get better so much quicker. If it's drawn out, they're not. So diet is super important. Regular treatment is super important. Because again, if it's drawn out and they're not seeing you regularly, daily basis, this can go months. And then this can sit around for years, you know, and it's not getting better. Qigong, really important. And slowly, as they're feeling better, increasing cardio exercise over time to strengthen the lung. Dietary recommendations here for convalescent should include slow-cooked broths and foods that are easily digestible and easy to build chi and blood. Broths can be helpful to strengthen the stomach and the spleen because they're already broken down so much, it's easy to transform those nutrients. It's easy to get them. You don't have to worry about the spleen having to work so hard or the stomach having to work so hard. They can strengthen the kidneys because the broths are oftentimes made with a lot of things that strengthen the kidneys. We'll go over some of that. You know, the salt and the broth, if it's sea salt, you know, people who use bone broth. I would avoid some of the heavy 
protein broths in the beginning. We're gonna, I'm gonna teach you guys today how to make a clear broth. Um, these things will strengthen the kidneys and the lungs. You can do things like daikon radish. I'll give, there's gonna be a bunch of recipes that we'll mention that I'll point you in directions of and you guys can take it from there. Again, I'm giving you a thought process and you guys are gonna run from there. So you'll see some of these here. So this is an example, my best friend, Simon Lockett. Uh, if you guys are interested, I leave his Instagram at the end. Simon Lockett is a uh, Sichuan chef. Um, he has an Instagram. I'll write it here in the comments. You guys can add him um, at Sichuan Kitchen. Um, he and I work together using traditional Chinese cooking formulas, and we analyze them via Chinese medicine. We're going to be coming out with a YouTube site in the future based on uh, traditional Chinese and culinary works, and then using you know. Chinese dietary medicine to talk about this. So this comes from um, from him, and then I analyzed it via Chinese medicine to see which one would be the best. So here we go. This is a traditional Sichuan broth. You use chicken necks if you can get them, or and a rib cage if you can get that. You can use pork belly. You can even use um, for vegetarians. You can use shiitake if you don't, or if you don't do pork, you only do chicken. That's fine. These are just different things. Then I go through a list of things: mineral water, fat spring onion, leek, all these things. Um, in this case, I would not use chicken feet in the beginning uh, because of the fact that I want it to be a clear broth. Later on, you can use chicken feet after their digestion has gotten better. Yeah, too thick, exactly. In the beginning, we want this clear and light. So I'm going to give this is all directions that we're going to go through. I'm not going to talk about it, but you guys can go through them. And it'll explain how to make this step by step. Then I go through in here a breakdown of everything and how it's used in Chinese medicine. Chicken being warming, strengthening the stomach and the spleen. Pork nourishes yin chi. Particularly people who become yin deficient, they lose a lot of weight with COVID, right? So they lose a lot of weight and they're really gaunt. And they have people who have been intubated or they've lost a ton of weight. I, I have patients who were overweight before COVID and they lost 40, 50, 40 pounds in four weeks. They, had, they didn't eat for four weeks. So this is something like pork belly being used to make the broth can really build back yin. It's very good at building back yin and chi and blood in that case. Um, you don't have to use that if you don't want. You can use chicken mineral water. You know, nourishes yin chi, nourishes the kidneys. Spring onion, there's a ton of things in allium family plants that can be used. Um, you can adjust, again, shellfish. If there's an allergy to shellfish, you can adjust that. We have dried scallops in here or shrimp because all shellfish have an effect on the kidneys to strengthen them. But remember, these things that have an effect at strengthening the kidneys oftentimes affect another organ as the kidney combusts its chi to that organ, right? So scallops, why did we pick scallops? Not only do they, using two or three dried scallops really bring the broth together, but scallops will help and assist the kidneys in holding down and anchoring lung chi. It assists the kidney lung connection. That's why scallops are so good. That's why scallops are good here. So water metal element, if you want to think about it in five elements, right? Ginger, obviously, we're just going to run through this. You can also use shrimp if you're not going to use scallops. Um, and I talk about this here. Another thing is Sichuan peppers. Sichuan peppercorns, hua jiao in Chinese for you Chinese speakers, is really good at warming the middle jiao, um, is really good at killing parasites. So it's very good at cleansing and keeping the digestion flowing and clearing things out of the intestines, right? Um, it's clearing. It's also very good at clearing cold and also helping with uh, phlegm that becomes congealed in the area and also vomiting and diarrhea. Um, shiitake mushrooms, they talk about what they do here with the spleen and stomach, on and on and on. We talk about how to cook, cook the soup, um, so you guys can follow that. Other recovery foods real quick, we're getting to the end of this. Um, other good examples of uh, recipes can be found that I've personally used with patients, because a lot of patients, I need to get them something. I, I'll go out and I'll buy them all the setup and I'll make the broth and I'll give them a Tupperware container of it. I'll say, use a scoop of this every time you make this meal, you know. Um, so uh, Yuan Wang's book, Ancient Wisdom Modern Kitchen, has a number of really, really good recipes that are phenomenal. Um, a lot of her recipes are based around earth school principles. If you read them, you'll be like, wow, this is really earth school based. Even the teas at the end that she has, many of them are earth school based. They have very few herbs, but they have the predominant herbs that will help the condition, along with uh, common available teas or common available herbs that you can buy. So um, recipes such as that she has in there, I'll just give you a few. Champion chicken with goji berry. Phenomenal for, uh, recipe. I use the broth from the that I supplied here in the slides as the base for that for a lot of my patients. And they make that and they feel better immediately. They feel they have more energy, especially with the treatments that you're giving them daily. Now they have the chi. Now you treat them and they're getting much better. 
and they have something to pull from, right? And this is going to be chicken, goji berry, garlic, ginger, leek. You know, this is really, really good. It's going to be steamed for a while until it's really soft. Pulse of life tea, five flavor berry tea. I'm just naming things how she names them in the book. Uh, savory squash and azuki. Decongesting daikon, very good to get the remaining phlegm out of the lungs. Um, also, in early stages, if they feel like they're coming in, you can do this. You can use the you can use a broth we give you. She also has broths in her book. So some of the teas given in the back of her book are modifications of old school formulas designed to be easier for Western people to make. You can get a few things from a Chinese grocery store, maybe even a Chinese herbalist. Nothing's major. Nothing's like really, you, know, you don't have to worry. It's not like Ma Hong or anything like that. It's like uh, Mai Mendong and things that are pretty simple that nourish uh, the body. Um, tonifying the stomach and spleen are of the utmost importance. To help the lungs. Remember, mother feeds child. You've got to do this. Also, if a pathogen is latent, then it is very important. If it's still being held latent for a while, then it's still very important to strengthen the body starting with a healthy diet so the body can produce enough resources and eventually deal with a pathogen either by maintaining it in latency if they're never going to come out or helping to move it to the surface. So you need to make sure that you balance this, right? Um, so... Recovery. Divergent channels can continue to be used to shore up and consolidate in the upper levels. You know, gallbladder, liver, bladder, kidney, you can use these things. I named some of the things here. Spleen stuff. Some spleen can deal with excessive residual phlegm. Uh, gallbladder may be helped to pull out pathogens that are causing the person to exhibit Chow Yang disorder. Sometimes they'll feel better. You think they're doing all right. And then they start to feel like chest constriction. They start to sweat. Chow Yang disorders. Uh, bladder, kidney. If they feel like they're convalescing and they're catching all these colds afterwards, they're not really getting over this well. So you've probably got a weakness in the bladder kidney divergent, and you've got the pathogen still probably being held there. So you want to move it out and shore it up. So you probably may, you might want to do SDS and then DSD if you feel like they have enough. Um, if you feel like they have enough uh, uh, substance, you know, so DSD consolidates, SDS pulls things out. If you feel like there's a pathogen in that level, pull it out and then consolidate. Or if you feel like they don't have enough substance to pull that out, just consolidate for right now. Tonifying with moxa, super important. Harmonize and tonifying digestion and transforming lingering dampness and phlegm. Also builds postnatal chi. Things like earth school treatments are phenomenal for people who are undergoing lingering digestive symptoms that seem to be aggravated by or aggravate um, other symptoms they're having. So you can use moxa on these points too. Um, so I give you some examples here. This one comes from, a, this is an earth school uh, acupuncture treatment. Um, the upper jowl, if you want to dredge in fire, REN 13, PC6. Middle jowl for purging intestines and safeguarding and strengthening the kidneys, REN 12, stomach 36. Lower jowl to strengthen the spleen, REN 10, stomach 25. You could also add REN 6 to strengthen the kidneys, and the, you know, to help strengthen the spleen. So if there's no yin fire, you can use moxa. So if you notice that there's not a lot of yin deficiency at that point, then you can use, um, then you can use moxa to help the tonic. So I give you some points here that you can use. Remember, you can moxa stomach or spleen six to tonify yin. You can do that. You warm the body to tonify yin. You can do that. You can also needle. You can do these things. Um, you can transform lingering dampness by first draining spleen nine. This is something I do with COVID patients. And then tonifying spleen nine. So draining it will help to clear and transform dampness. And then tonifying it will shore up the spleen. So these are like needling techniques that I've used that work really, really well. Um, if lingering blood stasis or phlegm you can use in the chest, you can use pericardium 5 because it's used to disperse. If the liver pulse is wiry, which happens in a lot of COVID patients, because the liver holds on to a lot of heat and there's a diaphragm spasming, you can use a series of points here, bladder 17, bladder 18, liver 3, liver 2. Again, these are primary points that I'm just adding on the back end if you feel like it's moved out of the divergence and something else is happening. or maybe you feel, Again, it's your personal preference. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, you can find me. My full name is Mark Elliott Mastrandria. I do not have a website. In fact, when this whole thing is over, I am probably going to disappear again off to Asia. Um, so, but you can add me on Facebook, Mark Mastrandria, no Elliott in that one. This is my clinic email address. For more information on authentic Sichuan recipes and traditional Chinese cooking skills, I strongly suggest you follow Sichuan Kitchen um, on Instagram. He and I are working together to come out with some major projects. I also suggest that um, you guys look online for this uh, society. So in Chinese, we call it Zhuge Lianghui. Zhuge Lianghui means a meeting of the minds, right? The, the, the wise minds. And it's a, it's, a, it's a society that was started last year to preserve and progress traditional knowledge and wisdom 
particularly starting in China, but moving on for that. And a number of the members uh, are people who, the founding members are people who have extensive understanding of Chinese medicine, Chinese Qigong, uh, Chinese cooking, Taoism, culture, martial arts, um, and we're building this. So if you guys are, um, if you guys are looking for uh, more information on what I do, a lot of that will be put out on that uh, Facebook page. I do not have a website. Um, after I let go of my clinic in 2016 and left the United States, I just need to leave Chinese. I need to leave everything aside for a while and not keep following because I was changing directions and studying Chinese and other things in, in China. So, um, so yeah. So thank you guys for having me. If you have any questions, like I said, add me. I'll get back to you as much as I can. And if Don is interested, we can do another one if this brings clarification. Uh, hopefully the slides will and we can we can do more in the future. Thank you, Mark, for a great class today. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. If you like to get your hands on the lecture notes, please make sure that you log into your eLotus account. If you don't have an account, you are more than welcome to sign up for one. And the lecture notes will be on the course access page. This webinar has been recorded and will be available on our TCM Wisdom Tube starting tomorrow. So please check our website and our website then. That's it for today, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us today, and we will see you at our next webinar. Bye. I'd just like to say before everybody goes away, have faith in your medicine. It works. All right. There's a there's a phrase I used to use when I taught in Beijing. Um, to try to explain to these up and coming doctors how real your medicine is. And I used to say, Zhong Yi Shu Jian Yi, meaning Chinese medicine is true medicine. It's real medicine. It's just as real as the Western medicine in the hospital is. It's about your ability to perform it through your understanding of it and your ability to apply it. It's not about the fact that the medicine doesn't work. It always works. Know that. Have trust in that because your medicine will always work in every situation as long as you use it in a wise way correctly analyze the situation time.